So I'd like to welcome members to the third meeting of the Economy Committee and advise any members and those in the public gallery that you can use your mobile devices as long as they are in airplane mode and muted. Um, and they can connect to assembly Wi-Fi, passwords, details are available in the gallery rule. It's not permitted to take photographs or to record any of the meeting. Um, so this morning we are going to hear from the Minister and Permanent Secretary on the Department's priorities and challenges and then we will be receiving, receiving a more in-depth briefing from, from Paul Grockett and his team around preparations for leaving the EU and the work that the Department needs to undertake during the transition period. The Committee will also consider two statutory rules, the TUPE rules and the transportation of dangerous goods and pressure equipment. Um, there are a number of pieces of correspondence for consideration as well, um, and I'm sure members are aware that yesterday it was reported that the RHI inquiry report is due to be published on Friday the 13th of March, and Sir Patrick Coughlin will be making a statement on the report on that day in the Long Gallery. So, um, moving on then to, to item number one, which is apologies, and we have our, our long-standing apology yeah. from Stuart. And Claire has highlighted that she'll be a wee bit late this morning. Um, so then moving on to the draft minutes of last week's meeting, um, which is on page four of your pack. Are members content that the minutes are an accurate record of the meeting? Yep. Good. Thank you. Um, item three then is chairperson's business and we have nothing no to note at the minute. Um, okay, so moving on then to, to the minister's briefing um, on the departmental priorities. Um, there is a clerk's memo at page 17 of your pack um, and the department's first day brief on page 19 and just to remind members that this briefing will be hand started yep. um, and I'd like to win, welcome the minister um, Diane Dodds and the permanent secretary Mike Brennan. Thank you if you would like to give us a well, little bit of First of all can I say uh, thank you um, for the opportunity to come to the committee today and to talk you through um, some of the issues um, within uh, the department, some of the challenges and some of the exciting things that um, we, I hope, will work together to deliver um, in the next uh, couple of years that we have left of this mandate. Um, I think that um, politics and politicians and Stormont have been given a second chance. So I'm really looking uh, forward to working with you and working together with you so that we can deliver what is the best um, for uh, our people here in Northern Ireland. Um, I really want us to see Northern Ireland's economy as being competitive, promoting innovation, attracting foreign investment and creating jobs. When we do that, then we have prosperity for families and for the people that we represent. So that is my overarching um, objective here um, as the economy minister. But um, <coughs> we have um, some challenges um, in that. And um, of course, um, one of those challenges I, as I outlined um, during question time last week, or this week and last Monday, was uh, is the actual um, process that we will now go through in our exit from the European Union. Brexit has caused many of us to have many different opinions and has caused divides. But I think it is now a time for us to come together. It is a fact. Brexit has happened and we now need to work out where we can best place Northern Ireland in the midst of those challenges and indeed opportunities. So the next uh, number of months will be taken up with looking at uh, the challenges um, of uh, Brexit. In the new decade, new approach agreement, um, the UK government give us certain pledges and we collectively need to hold the government to account for those pledges. So we are working um, to um, understand what the government mean by the guarantee of unfettered access to the GB market. If um, we do nothing else, the most important thing that we can do 
in the short and medium term for our economy is to protect our place within uh, the GB market. We also need to protect our cross-border trade. Um, but the relationship with the rest of the United Kingdom is absolutely critical. In 2017, Northern Ireland's sales to Great Britain were valued at 11.3 billion and purchases from Great Britain at 13.3 billion. Around 23,000 businesses in Northern Ireland traded with Great Britain in 2017. That's the scale of the issue that is in front of us. So access to the GB market, um, NI to GB and GB to NI, is absolutely critical. Not just um, for um, our firms um, who uh, bring supplies for the manufacturing process and other things, but also for the high street, where many of our local um, shops are served um, daily, actually, um, by um, the larger um, stores in England and uh, particularly Scotland. So we need, that is, that is a huge challenge for us and no doubt we'll want to talk about that later on in, in detail. But we want to also to build and maintain international relationships and collaborations post-Brexit. In order, in order to help Northern Ireland complete. Um, and that um, is very, very important. And to have that close economic relationship and cooperation <coughs> with our nearest neighbours. So we want to develop an overarching economic strategy for the post-Brexit world, um, a strategy that will focus on skills, energy, exports, um, and deliver the priorities in the programme for government. And also to build um, on strengths in artificial intelligence and, of course, um, in line with the New Deal, New Decade approach uh, to create and further strengthen our um, expertise in cyber security. Um, I... I'm actually, because of my background, quite excited about um, having to deal with the skills and further education element uh, of this uh, portfolio. Um, and this year, our Assured Skills Academies in financial services, IT, welding and tourism have upskilled 227 people with 190 of those people securing jobs at the end of that process. And um, I think um, it will be exciting to uh, look at how we can develop that process even further. Um, up to September of this year, 15,540 jobs were created. Uh, with the services sector accounting for 78% of that growth in jobs. Um, employment just doesn't create wealth, but it also boosts individuals, communities, with um, increasing levels of health, self-confidence, self-respect and social inclusion. And I'm really keen to look at that in light of the priority that the government or the, the executive have given to mental health and resilience. And I think that we can all play our part in that particular issue. Um, so we're doing um, some good work, but we need to do more. And we need uh, to ensure that not just um, are we providing uh, pathways for the young people, and I'm very excited, and I think it's, it's a good example of uh, cross-departmental collaboration. Um, that we will produce a 14 to 19 year old strategy for young people with the Department of Education. But it's also important to um, ensure that we have lifelong learning and that we have and create and maintain opportunities uh, for people to learn in whatever situation they find themselves. So I'm really keen to review some of the strategies that are there to ensure that we have the maximum flexibility for people in their situations um, to learn and to progress and to eventually be part of that uh, jobs um, ladder. 
Um, Ulster University's uh, Belfast Development Project is one of the largest capital builds um, of its kind in Europe. There have been challenges, and I'm sure we will talk about those challenges. Um, but I will continue to monitor this project. And at the end of this process, it would be exciting to know that um, we will have a world-class campus for a progressive education for our young people that matches the needs and skills of our economy. Um, the expansion of Ulster University's McGee campus, the creation of a graduate entry medical school have also been included as priority actions within the new decade, new approach agreement. Um, and I think that there is much work for us to do in delivering on those projects. Tourism is hugely important uh, to Northern Ireland. Um, it drives economic growth, supports jobs, um, and in the last 10 years, it's really quite a phenomenal figure, um, overall visitor numbers have grown by 85% to 5 million. Overall visitor revenue has doubled with spend in 2018 reaching 968 million. And the tourism sector in Northern Ireland supports 65,000 jobs. So hugely, hugely impactful. Um, on, on Northern Ireland's economy. I am uh, and will be working with you on a tourism strategy um, which will um, contain targets, I hope, to double the value of tourism to the Northern Ireland economy and create another 25,000 jobs within the sector. <coughs> Climate change um, is high on everyone's agenda, um, as it should be. And I recognise our responsibilities to contribute to the reductions required by the Paris Agreement. And we in this department are committed to playing our part in reaching uh, the UK government's target um, of net zero carbon by 2050. Some good news on the issue. Um, in, in the 12 months to September 2019, 44.9, 45 per cent almost, of Northern Ireland's electricity was uh, generated from renewable sources. We lead the way in this particular aspect of uh, renewable energy. We are already exceeding our target, which was set back in 2011, 10, um, by, um, to achieve by 2020. So Northern Ireland is exceeding what was quite a significant target then, given where we were coming from in that particular um, issue. Um, we want to develop again a new energy strategy, very, very important. Um, and a call for evidence was launched in December, and those responses are due back. That call will close on March the 20th. And there will be further public engagement, and I know lots of conversations with this committee as to how we develop that uh, energy strategy. Um, this committee, um, like everyone else, um, will have heard the announcement yesterday um, that um, the report um, on the RHI scheme is due on the 13th of March. I will ask Mike to comment on it maybe in more detail. I'm sure we'll get to that specific um, issue fairly quickly. Um, but just to outline to the com committee, um, I have played no part within uh, the inquiry. I've had no um, conversations or any communication with the inquiry whatsoever. And I have asked my officials to keep it that way. Um, but I intend to act in good faith um, on the results of that inquiry and to act in a way that is fair to both those who participated in the scheme in, in good faith and to the taxpayers who obviously fund the scheme. Um, some work has been carried out um, within my department um, as a result of the inquiry proceedings. Um, but there will be a Brexit uh, or a, an inquiry subcommittee set up by the executive 
um, which is the responsibility, I think, of the Minister for Finance, um, who will take forward the issues of the inquiry. And those issues, I suspect, will uh, cross-cut across uh, many government uh, departments. Um, for those interested, as I come almost to the end of this presentation, Project Stratum, um, the delivery of broadband, <coughs> is, I think, something that is exciting, deliverable, um, and hugely, hugely important for Northern Ireland's economy and to increase one of the issues that we have within this economy is the issue of productivity um, and therefore the issue of better connection <coughs> and broadband um, can only increase uh, productivity. About 90% of the delivery area for Project Stratum is for in those areas um, that are rural or in small um, housing uh, areas of housing. So. I think this is something that I think will help the economy right across the whole of Northern Ireland um, and it's something that I think um, can be delivered within this Assembly's um, period and will deliver good results uh, for the economy. I'm sure, colleagues, there are many, many other issues that we will um, talk about this morning and want to address. Um, I'm here to address your concerns, if I need specific information, we of course will get that to the committee. But I want to work in a spirit of cooperation and openness with this committee. We have a lot of work to do, a short period of time to do it, and I know that we will um, deliver um, for the people of Northern Ireland. Um, I obviously am new to this committee. I've just come back from 11, almost 11 years in the European Parliament. Um, and there are many issues that um, we need to, to look at collectively and, and get a good way forward on. Um, and I've been discussing this with Mike and, and some of the officials. And we would be happy to offer the committee some closed sessions to work with officials on the detail of some of the areas, whether it's skills or energy or whatever that area is that the committee should decide. But if uh, you want to come back to us in the department, we are very happy to work uh, with you to provide closed briefings so that we can work in confidence and work together um, on, on many of the issues. So I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Minister. And, uh, um to, to, to respond as well, that we are looking forward to working with you in a collaborative way and we're keen to support the work of the department. We all recognise the, the short period of time that, that we have uh, over the next two years and we're keen to do as much as possible. So um, thank you for the briefing and I'd just like to pick up on a few issues to, to start with. Um, I'm going to start with Ulster University. Um, Last week at the committee, we had some comments around the, the Ulster University and the <coughs> business case, and as one of the priorities for the restored executive in terms of the new decade, new approach, um, being expanding McGee in line with the previous commitments, um, including expanding the Mazen. I was just wondering if you could clarify where that is currently in terms of um, being developed, or has that process started yet? Um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Um, so, if we, um, I'll ask Mike to okay. fill in in some of the areas. So, I'll, I'll, I'll give a, a, a brief overview and um, I'll, Mike can fill in in some of the areas where we may, if, if, if we want to take the two separately, if that's okay. We address the Ulster University issue first, I think, is, is quite important. So, um, Ulster University has experienced significant difficulties with uh, the new build campus um, at the York Street. Um, but it is a huge project and we'll see the move from Jordanstown down into Belfast in a, when it is finished in a new state-of-the-art building which can only better improve the life chances of the young people that, that go to it. So. Um, but there are significant difficulties. And those uh, difficulties um, are, are around um, an um, a projected capital cost of 254 million, um, which we now know has risen to around 370 million. So there is a significant gap 
in the funding to finish the capital project. Um, part of this is a rise in costs, part of this is the delivery, and part of this is the fact that the European Investment Bank withdrew its funding for the project. So we are left with a situation where we want to support the Ulster University in going forward. We want to make sure that it is a thriving um, educational um, campus for young people, but that it uh, meets its targets in terms of its finances, both capital and resources. So um, we have an issue around the 126 million. Um, I think in December of last year, the department uh, approved a fairly conditional um, 126 million of loan support. Um, that proposal currently sits, if I'm right, with uh, the Department of Finance. Um, and today I have a meeting actually with the Finance Minister and I'm hopeful of discussing this particular issue with them so that we can um, plot the way forward um, that ensures that the university can, can progress um, and that ensures that we have a financially viable um, project to deal with. Okay, so just a, a few additional comments, um, Chair. Um, last week there was a lot of um, discussion around the, the Greater Belfast development and, and how it was progressing. And obviously um, the, the committee will be aware of the, the audit office report into a major project delivery and some of the concerns around what has happened in terms of the cost escalation in relation to the, the Greater Belfast development. So a lot of work has taken place um, in the department to, to see actually what happened, what transpired over recent years in, in the rollout of that project. And uh, we've had some quite detailed discussions with the university um, and also with colleagues in the Department of Finance about how we move forward. So costs have increased considerably, as the minister said. So the key imperative now is how do we, how do we finish out the project? So. Uh, there is a need for um, an additional financial transactions capital loan of about £126 million that's needed over the next two years to finish it out. Um, so some of the, the conditions that the Minister referred to um, are really around getting assurance that there's proper uh, project management processes in place to finish out the project, and also to look at the capacity <coughs> of the university itself in terms of being able to manage that out and ensure that the finances of the university as an institution are robustly managed. So um, specifically then in, in relation to the McGee expansion yeah. um, and where that currently sits okay. in terms of the, the commitments in New Decade, New Approach. Okay, so there's, actually, there's two commitments effectively within NDNA. So there's um, the commitment to specifically the, the Graduate Entry Medical School. And as you know, there is effectively £60 million uh, ring-fenced for the delivery of that. So uh, the, the first imperative really is for the University and the Department of Health um, to come to an agreed way forward on how that has to be rolled out. The wider McGee campus expansion um, is something that we're um, exploring with the University. Um, the difficulty is that we haven't seen um, a business case from the University since um, one was, that was circulated in 2016. Um, and that, I suspect, needs considerable updating. Um, the costs in that um, now dated business case um, were somewhere in the order of the construction, somewhere in the order of about £300 million, and then year-on-year -year resource del costs of about £103 million to run the expanded facility. So you know, we've asked the university for an update on that business case and what their projections are. When we have that, then we can see where it, you know, how, how best to proceed. Okay, and so the, the commitment and new decade, new approaches to bring forward for the executive to bring forward proposals around that. Yeah. So will the department be working with the university to develop the the plan to reach those numbers? Yeah, we will definitely. Okay. Can I um, <laughs> just uh, my first um, engagement um, out of the department? They do let you out sometimes. Mm -hmm. My first engagement out of the department um, was actually to McGee, um, and it's absolutely fascinating to see the work on robotics, artificial intelligence, and the delivery of the training for nurses um, at the McGee campus. Um, and, you know, as, as a minister charged with the economy for the whole of Northern Ireland, it's important that we develop skills throughout. But we have considerable work to do to make the progression. Um, and we will um, obviously also be talking to the Department of Health 
as to how far their plans have progressed in this as well. Um, it's, it's, there are no easy, quick fixes, yes. but there's, you know, we need a work plan to make the delivery possible. Yeah. I think that, that, that's welcome to hear because it is an absolutely transformative project in terms of the, north, the wider northwest. Um, and obviously the Irish government have um, said that they are open to, to contributing to, to the um, expansion of McGee as well. Can you just clarify where the decision for the Graduate Injury Medical School the sign off of that actually sits? Because I think there's a little bit of confusion around whether it's DFE or DOH. It's the oh. Department of Health. It's definitely Department of Health. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'd just like to, to move on then. You mentioned the project stratum yes. um, and that 90% of the the, of the funding for that project is going to rural areas or um, <coughs> small housing areas. Yep. Will properties with no current access be prioritised um, in terms of the, the rollout of that? My understanding uh, in this, and bear in mind that the, the um, procurement um, process was started before I became a minister, is that uh, we will know uh, the details as the, uh, when the procurement process is finished. And obviously, since there is a, a legal procurement process underway, I am not going in any shape or form uh, to get involved uh, within that. Um, the... Project Stratum will uh, cover um, about 90% of everything that it'll cover will be rural areas where broadband is either non-existent or um, in in um, you know in a ve in very poor uh, delivery. Um, but it will also <coughs> sorry, excuse me, this morning. Um, it will also cover um, those areas to try to bring them up to around the 30 megabits um, of delivery. Um, that uh, procurement process is due to finish mid-year. We would hope to yeah. May time, mid May, yeah, June. May, June times. Um, and then the actual um, sort of process will become uh, much, much clearer. <coughs> Um, anything further do you want to just, just to say that in, in, in recent days um, oh yes we've had some uh, additional information provided by Ofcom, Ofcom and DCMS um, from um, the bidding companies in terms of uh, likely coverage um, and up until this week we thought, thought that some 97,000 additional properties would be brought in under the embrace of Project Stratum however we think that the number of, of properties um, exposed to um, coverage of less than 30 megabytes per second is now down to 79,000. What that effectively means is that the money made available, so the £150 million plus £15 million from DERA plus the private sector contribution will go further. So um, officials tell us that they expect that um, firstly all properties and now obviously there will be one or two in the extremes that would cost exorbitant amounts of money to get but the coverage will be significantly greater than we thought even a week ago. I think all of us, especially those who represent the more rural constituencies, know the deep frustration there is yeah. of people who have no access to broadband and um, I would urge as much as possible that, that that can be taken on board in terms of what is delivered. Um, Minister, you, I was listening during question time the other day um, when you were commenting around the traineeship. Um, and I know the committee has had some correspondence in relation to that and probably a lot of individual yes, members as well and yourself. Um, um, and we all know the, the good work that some of the training providers do and, and the concern that there is there in terms of potentially losing those, those qualifications. So I was just wondering what your, your position on it. Oh, or if you've come this, to this, yeah, this is an issue that is um, of concern to me. Um, I want to make sure that young people have valid and good career progression. That is not just evident in what we would look at in terms of normal apprenticeships or higher level apprenticeships, which I think are fascinating and really something that we want to build on. Um, the skills academies, etc., as well. But the specific issue that you mention is one that um, has been drawn to my attention. I come from a background uh, of working with kids and communities in inner city Belfast for a very long period of time. 
I know the work that training providers do for those children and how they help them to progress um, to a, a better pathway and a better future. And if we're to have a stable Northern Ireland, then we have to reach out to all children and young people in all communities, um, really no matter where those communities are. So I am keen to see that we are not driving everything in one direction, but that the training um, that we provide and the schemes that we provide will have flexibility. So that if a young person is progressing um, very, very well with a training provider, that they can progress further until they're ready to go to the next um, um, level. So I'm really keen to see that. I've had a couple of fairly long meetings with um, officials around that. I've asked for a review of those particular issues <clears throat> and to come back to me to see how we can introduce flexibility into the scheme so that we are not disadvantaging the young people that we want to do well. So that, and that's really important. Yeah, I think that that, that will be welcome. Um, I think we all recognise that there, that there are, are some young people in particular who are harder to reach and that, you know, yeah. one size doesn't Absolutely. fit all in terms of the training that's provided. So that Can I say I've, I've had an invitation to go to visit Impact on the Shankill. Obviously, I have visited Impact on many, many occasions. Mm -hmm. I've had an, an invitation to go to Workforce in the Springfield Road and I hope to do that within the next number of weeks. And it's very important that we seek the views, but that we also have really valid pathways for young people going forward and um, then just finally from me around the the economic strategy obviously that's one of the ones that is listed within the, the new decade new approach and there there are a number of other items that are, are listed in that document as well in terms of for example the green new deal um, then commitments around the cyber security and, and all of the skills um, and I was just wanting to get some understanding of the process that's now going to be undertaken in terms of like reviewing the previous industrial strategy or bringing forward new proposals and building in all, all of those various other strands? Yes, well actually I think this is one area of work that's actually really exciting and something that we can um, take forward. We want to bring forward a new economic strategy. We have a, a draft industrial strategy that's been sitting on the shelf for quite some uh, period of time. We want to bring forward a new economic strategy. We want to work with you to develop that new economic strategy. And we want to make sure that that economic strategy tackles a number of things. Um, in Northern Ireland, we have, at the moment, almost record employment rates. Um, but we have issues around economic inactivity, we have issues around productivity, um, and we want to actually develop our economy to take all of those things into account, as well as taking into account um, some of the new technologies and how that our economy can progress um, in a, a, what is going to be an ever-evolving and vastly evolving um, situation. So yes, a new economic strategy to take into account all of those issues. <coughs> I was down and we launched recently um, a, an academy with Microsoft to train young people. Um, we want to do more of this kind so that not just are we looking at building our um, product productivity that we do, but the, the jobs that we are going out and looking for are better jobs more rewarding jobs in terms of fi their finance and, and their career progression. So better and more jobs as well into that mix. Um, this afternoon I'm meeting a delegation from Qatar um, to discuss um, opportunities to develop um, our economic activity with uh, that particular region as well. And I hope reasonably soon to be going out to America to do some of that uh, in the near future as well. So yes, this is all work that will be undertaken in the next number of weeks and months. Um, we look forward to a really busy time ahead to get that done. Anything? Yeah, and just, just to add um, to what the Minister said, it's important um, that we think of the economic strategy not as a sort of standalone document that sits in the corner. 
Um, it's really uh, an umbrella document that brings together a, a lot of strands of work that not reside not just in this department but elsewhere. So, for example, it's a tourism strategy, a skills strategy, an export strategy, energy strategy, a food strategy, working with colleagues in DERA, an infrastructure strategy, working with colleagues in infrastructure. So, an economic strategy as a concept is something that really brings together all those other key elements that need to be progressed by the executive. I think when you actually hear that kind of thing, you realise the actual breadth of this department um, and the work um, that we will do together in, in this department. The breadth of it is quite phenomenal. It, it scales a lot of issues. Yeah, I think it, it's very welcome to hear that we're, we're going to collaborate on the development of that new strategy, and I'm, I'm sure we're all keen to do that. Um, I just. In particular, note the, in the draft business plan that the department currently has, there is no mention of, of climate, for example. There's a couple of mentions of sustainability. Um, and you know, the other evening we passed the, the climate emergency motion and, and to take forward those commitments. Uh, and so I think it, it would be there is great potential from the Green New Deal in terms of like skills development and infrastructure development and, and exploiting our natural resources as well. So in terms of renewable energy, so I think that those are all things that, that we'd be very keen to see built into a new economic strategy. Yes, so an energy strategy that didn't embrace, for example, net zero carbon or you know renewable energy just wouldn't be a robust energy strategy. Okay, I'm going to Christopher. Thank you very much. Um, Minister, thank you and welcome, uh, welcome home <laughs> and welcome to your post. Um, one of the issues that uh, you mentioned in the House this week related to leave for those who have been affected by the loss of a child. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, could you speak to that for a few minutes just in terms of how that's going to work in practice and how that will be brought in? If I can... Thank you, specific note. Um, look, <coughs> a couple of weeks ago, um, in the department, I, I um, we heard that in in the, our government was going to do this. <coughs> to be honest, in this day and age, I actually didn't believe that we didn't have provision for parents who had had a child bereavement. It's, it seems like in a progressive modern democracy that it is the sensible and compassionate thing to do. So, look, the government uh, in London have announced um, that those um, that there will be a parental bereavement leave. It'll come into force in April. Um, it will allow for bereaved par parents who are employees to be entitled to at least two weeks leave. Not a lot. Um, following the loss of a child or a stillbirth after 24 weeks of pregnancy. Um, employees with 26 weeks continuous service will be entitled to receive this statutory pay and it is about £151 per week. Um, currently, we do have some provisions and some uh, employers in Northern Ireland quite rightly offer compassionate conditions for employees in this particular area. But I think it would be best if we can move forward to legislate for this as a statutory minimum. And um, I have asked officials to look at this and to bring forward to me the best path that we can get. Um, to actually make this the law as soon as possible in Northern Ireland. Um, I cannot see that anyone would um, demur from that. Um, do you have a sort of time frame in mind? No, we've just asked the officials, and unless Mike has a very, very urgent no, update on that particular no. issue, um, but I, I, it is my intention to do it, and it is my intention to do it as soon as possible, and our consultation might lead us to some slightly different conclusions, but I hope that we can get at least a match uh, what uh, England and Wales are doing in this issue. I think it is just the right thing to do. Okay. Um, in relation to the EU, how, how, can we be re, how can we be reassured that at the end of this process the expansion will be delivered in Belfast and um, how will we examine how we got to this point? Yes, um, I think that that's um, well worthy of our consideration. The Expansion project is already very well underway. Anybody who drives down that um, through that junction will see it. 
um, rising up in an area, actually in an area of very, very high deprivation. And it will bring significant economic benefit to an area that has suffered very, very significantly during um, the, the past number of years and for which um, there was much dereliction and, and, and will bring economic <coughs> opportunity. And I continuously talk to the university, not just about economic opportunity, but educational opportunity for the communities that live around the university. I don't believe that universities as institutions live onto themselves, but that they do have a responsibility <coughs> for the communities that, that they are placed in. So I'm, I'm hopeful and I will be working with the university to ensure that we can deliver um, what I think will be a fantastic facility um, for young people in Northern Ireland. Um, I think that we will institute a review of how we actually got to this particular point to ensure that going forward we cannot repeat that um, scenario and that the university has both the capacity and the capability to make sure that it is sustainable into the future. So lessons to be learnt, things to be done, but underneath it all we need to ensure that we have that delivery. And I look forward to talking to the Finance Minister. I'm sure this is not an issue of huge um, you know, difference between us. It's just a matter of getting it delivered and sorted out in the best way possible with the assurance to taxpayers um, and also the assurance that we will have full and proper delivery. Thank you. Alan? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, may I take this opportunity, just first opportunity, <coughs> to congratulate you on your appointment and wish you well going forward. Um, uh, three or four issues, Minister. Uh, I'll maybe I'll just go through them all and, and uh, you can maybe answer at the end. But uh, in terms of um, corporation tax, uh, the, fine minister, uh, the finance minister recently uh, made comments that appear to have knocked the concept of uh, a reduction in corporation tax back. And I know that it was uh, designed to obviously to make inward investment uh, more attractive. So just I wonder, uh, is it uh, off the agenda or is the executive still um, considering it? And uh, is, it, is it a weapon that you'll need to take to America with you and so forth when you're seeking inward investment? Mm -hmm. The other thing is in relation to the strategies. I've heard all the strategies this morning, but the one that I'm still not hearing is a manufacturing strategy. And, and this was, a, again, an idea that was brought forward in the last mandate to the Assembly by the opposition parties. Uh, but it was voted down, and uh, they, they didn't, the minister didn't feel the need for a manufacturing strategy. But given the, the huge challenges that that sector has faced over the last couple of years and the huge number of job losses, you know, I, I'm just wondering, uh, will the minister uh, consider um, developing a manufacturing strategy? Um, in terms of the hospitality sector, minister, we've heard this morning uh, you tell us about how important it is to the uh, Northern Ireland economy, and it really is, and it has been a huge success story for Northern Ireland over the, the, the last 10 years. Um, but one of the things that the hospitality sector have been lobbying, lobbying this committee for as well, is a reduction in the VAT rate uh, to give them a level playing field with the uh, hospitality sector in the Republic of Ireland. Um, so I'm just wondering if uh, your department uh, and yourself, Minister, will uh, look at that and will support any call for a, a, a VAT reduction. Also, the other challenge I think they're facing at the moment, and, and maybe have been over the last year or so when Brexit has been getting talked about, and they've been losing a lot of very um, skilled workers, welcome workers that have come in from the EU to help us develop our, our hospitality sector and enhance the, the skills uh, that, that are delivered. Um, and there is a danger that those people are going to, because of the uncertainty, they're going to vote with their feet and go home. We're going to lose that. Very pleased to hear about the upskill uh, training that you're doing for the hospital. That's very welcome. But it would be a disaster if we lost the skills that those uh, EU uh, workers have brought in Northern Ireland. And the last point, Minister, was the, the north-south uh, interconnector. Um, I know that uh, reading the document here, the Department of in in Infrastructure is saying that within three months, and the important word you're using may may approve a revised planning application for the north south interconnector. Now we know this is really vital um, uh, going forward to guarantee our, our energy. Um, 
Do we have uh, a plan B uh, to continue the guarantee supply of energy from 2023 going forward? Should uh, the department uh, not feel able to approve the planning application for the interconnector? Thank you. Ms. Thank you. That's a very comprehensive list of questions that I've I've That was up all night, Minister. <laughs> <Everybody's> <laughs> questions is the one. <laughs> but anyway, look, I'll, I'll, I'll have a rattle through of, of what I've got, and Mike will pick up uh, whatever um, I, I've, I've kind of missed. In terms of corporation tax, I don't want us to get into a situation where we're having kind of perceived differences uh, around this issue. Corporation tax, or the lowering of corporation tax, remains a tool in the toolbox that we can use in order to attract uh, investment. So it's very important. Um, and you can see um, how different levels of corporation tax um, here on this island have actually worked um, to uh, attract inward investment. From this was first mooted, the level of uh, UK corporation tax has come down very, very considerably. So there is less of a difference between us, for example, and Dublin. Who, by the way, um, are very, very working very hard at a European level to hang on to their very low rate uh, of corporation tax. And if we have something called the Common Consolidated Tax Base come in at a European level, um, that might actually um, make a very, very big difference to how corporation tax is treated in the Republic of Ireland, because uh, many European countries look at that rate with a lot of um, envy. And, and disquiet, I would have to say, but just an aside. Um, so corporation tax remains on the books, remains part of our toolkit, remains something that we would aspire to. But as I have said on many interviews over the last number of days, the very short to medium term issue that faces the economy is making sure that we are well set up in any post-Brexit scenario to ensure that our access to GB, North-South and to other markets in Europe and the rest of the world is completely open and that we have really, you know, not just GB, um, North-South access, but access to trade deals that uh, will help us uh, in the future. So. Um, in terms of a manufacturing strategy, we're going to bring um, forward, I think, an all-encompassing strategy in which manufacturing will play a very, very significant part. Manufacturing is absolutely core and vital to Northern Ireland, and we want to make sure that it grows, succeeds, and has the skills uh, and the um, base from which it can move forward, so it will be core uh, to what we're doing. Hospitality sector, and you're quite right, I'm going to just kind of group that together. You're quite right that um, over the last uh, number of years, a lot of people in the hospitality sector have come and settled to live amongst us and contribute very significantly to our communities and have enriched our lives here in Northern Ireland. We want to retain those people, but also there will always be the need for flexibility in the workplace. Um, and uh, we have been working um, with the government in London around the new immigration proposals, um, which are very, very important. Now, that started out with a salary threshold, which we thought um, was really unrealistic for people yes. here in Northern Ireland. Um, that has now come down to 25,600. Mm -hmm. That still is a fairly high salary threshold in terms of Northern Ireland, and we will be going back and making those points that it's very, very important that Northern Ireland has flexibility in its workplace and that this is important. Um, <coughs> we will see how the immigration uh, uh, bill and, and how it develops uh, at a national level. Um, but we will continue to work on that particular issue because that is one of the core issues um, that uh, we will need uh, to do. The hospitality and tourism sector has been growing exponentially in Northern Ireland. Um, this morning there was an event, I didn't go to it because obviously I'm here meeting you, but really to celebrate the success of Titanic and everything uh, that has been achieved down there. Um, just as a, an aside and um, a purely personal thing, my very first job when I was elected um, to Belfast City Council was to chair the Tourism Committee. And that was in 2005. 
not that long ago. Um, and we actually, our first document that we produced was a plan to build a Titanic exhibition centre. Look at how far we have progressed in that time. Offering product, reflecting our history, um, our maritime history, our manufacturing history, and all that is good about Northern Ireland in that area. And I had some visitors um, from Europe over um, and who hadn't been to Belfast before, and they were hugely impressed by that um, particular area. In Londonderry, look at how far we have come uh, with the development there. Um, I was up in the city not uh, terribly long ago, um, where we just on a personal visit, um, where we walked the bridge and, and parked in the barracks and walked over. And things are really progressing. So our tourism sector is really, really key. We want to grow that. We want to double what we get from tourism and make it a viable um, and vibrant as we possibly can. <coughs> Minister, would you consider supporting that, the quality That sector? is a reserved <coughs> issue. Yeah, yeah. And also um, may become more complex in an in a EU exit world um, in, in terms of the application of that. Um, and you know we have to see where that lands, but at the minute it's, a re it's reserved to, to national authorities to determine. Um, and if I may pick up just on a couple of additional points, um, in relation to um, a manufacturing strategy, um, the concern I have is that people still try to look at manufacturing as existing within a silo on its own right. And that, I don't think, applies anymore. Um, one of the things we have learned from the work over the last few years that the department has done in relation to Brexit matters is the interconnectedness between manufacturing and the wider economy and tradable services. So the minister earlier made reference to industries like cyber and artificial intelligence and the work going up in the key and the Cognitive Analytic Research Centre. You know, it's impossible really to classify that as manufacturing or services because the entire manufacturing process relies so significantly on services that I don't think you can create a bespoke manufacturing strategy and say, let that exist in splendid isolation. It doesn't really work like that anymore. Um, so you know, we, we, we just need to be careful of that as we construct the, the overarching economic strategy that I referred to earlier. And the second point is in relation to um, the Migration Advisory Council recommendations and the lowering of the threshold to just over just under 26,000. Um, when you have 65,000 people employed in the tourism sector locally um, and you set a threshold like that, a sector that relies so significantly on um, migrant labour, and you set a threshold which is above the, the private sector salary in Northern Ireland, it's going to pose quite fundamental problems Absolutely. for that sector. Oh, sorry, the interconnector. The point on the on, on the interconnector, um, it, well, a couple of points really. Um, obviously, it's it's for the Department of, um, for Infrastructure to try and progress that and take decisions. And I, I understand that there are some legal issues around that, which may constrain decision making for now. But the key point I would make is that the greater interconnector interconnectedness you have in energy markets, it's the consumer that benefits. So, for example, in the construct of the, the, the single uh, electricity market, the benefit to consumers in Northern Ireland. Per annum, it's 50 million euros. So the more we can exploit uh, interconnectors and the use of interconnectors and energy, the better and the quicker. <coughs> Thank you. Janine. Thank you very much, um, Minister, for, for the briefing this morning. And also, um, I, I want to say a, a personal hello to the permanent secretary because I'm sure we'll be breaking down his door for the next look, few look forward years. to that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice yeah. So, um, uh, and, and I do really welcome the ambition of you, Minister, looking at the collaborative work and approach and working across. Um, across sectors and across um, departments, because I think it's fundamental now that we can't work in silos, mm -hmm. uh, and working in silos it doesn't work. Um, uh, and so that joined up approach for government is, is fundamental. Um, there's two things that I want to talk about. Probably Brexit would be first, but I have to go to the university. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the reason I want to go to it, because I think, um, in order for us to really deliver, deliver a vibrant economy, we do need to do things different this time. Uh, and, and we are being given a second chance, and we must, uh, we must take that chance. And I think, you know, there has been a failure from, from previous ministers, uh, and, and with good intentions and, and, and good people, 
did uh, did not make the hard decisions uh, and move the place forward. And we need to actually take control now. And, and good people need to do the right things going forward. And one of that, uh, you know, the, the key objectives of the department, you have four uh, strategic objectives: accelerate and innovate, uh, innovate research, enhance education, skills, employability, um, deliver inclusive, sustainable growth. Uh, that is regionally balanced, succeeding in global markets, building the best economic structure, deliver uh, a regulatory environment that optimises economic opportunities Ooh. and ensure departments have <clears throat> effective governance. Overriding all of that is that you have to be able to participate in the economy. And it is a skills-driven economy, and skills is the engine to that econ economy. In the North West, we don't have any oil for the engine, and we haven't had it for many, many years. And to hear last week at this committee meeting, um, us been told of the concerns and the challenges within Ulster University uh, Belfast campus, and I appreciate how difficult they are, but to say that there's going to be a knock-on effect that will slow up the delivery of the McGee campus and that expansion to 10,000 students is just not acceptable and we won't be doing the right thing in this mandate if we do not take that challenge up. We've got to deliver the expansion of the university. I know, uh, Minister, you've said that there's a lot of work to be done, but there has been a business case. This is a political decision. Now, I know uh, business cases need to be updated regularly uh, and they're not set in stone and I completely accept that and it has been four years since that business case w was delivered. But you know, it was the government that failed the business, business case because there was none uh, here to address those issues. So I don't want the unintended consequences <coughs> of um, uh, the Ulster University's capability and capacity to have a knock-on or unintended attentions that the expansion of McGee doesn't take place within uh, a, a, a time frame that is going to help us to become involved and contribute to the overall economy. We can't accelerate uh, research. We can't enhance education skills if we do not have the skills. And the skills is our higher educated people within our economy. We have a small uh, higher education provision. We must deal with it and we must deal with the challenges around it. Now that's not a question, but it's just a statement of fact. <laughs> and <laughs> and, 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 and uh, it's the statement of fact, and it's one which I am passionate about, and it's one that I really want to have access. That, that you know, the whole of Northern Ireland has access to economy. It is economy for all, and I welcome the opportunity of of the intention and your good intention, and perhaps good people will do good things going forward. So the other the other point now, and I'll just give it Brexit. Brexit, I suppose, is um, it's a process. It's not an event. So the event didn't happen. <coughs> Uh, last Friday night. Um, there's a lot to do and there's a lot of conflicting um, conflicting uh, commentary around it, even within the UK. And I am concerned, I am concerned for our businesses. I do not want um, any kind of barriers between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. It is a vital market for all of our businesses and we must do everything that we can to protect our businesses going forward. And I would just, uh, you, you had your first um, Executive subcommittee meeting yesterday on Brexit. I would like to hear a little bit about that as well. But I would like your comments about the provision of higher education and how we make sure um, that the whole of Northern Ireland is able to become engaged in, in your ambition for the economy. Sinead, I absolutely share um, your passion um, and ambition for a skilled workforce throughout Northern Ireland. I think that that is hugely, hugely important. And I want, within that skilled workforce, to have those skills open and available to all within Northern Ireland. So I want to see all communities um, benefit um, from opportunity to avail of better skills, better provision and better training. So I absolutely share your passion. I think that this is one of the most important things that we can do to have a stable Northern Ireland going forward is to provide young people and indeed to those in other stages of their lives with the opportunity for education, advancement, um, etc. etc. So those that I absolutely share your passion in relation to that. Um, 
in terms of McGee expansion, I, and I've spoken to you privately as well about this, and no doubt we will privately as well take up yeah. um, the, the issue again. Um, there is work to be done. I cannot avoid that statement. So there is a significant amount of work to be done. The fact remains that um, we have not had devolution for a period of time and therefore we need to work very hard to do the catch-up to make sure that we have work to be done. But for the expansion um, to succeed and go forward, we need to lay firm buildings to do that. And I will give you my commitment to work with you on, on the issues, but there are uh, issues to be faced and um, not least of all the finance, the updating of the business case, the different issues that we have to get ahead and do. That means we have to work harder just to get it done. That's just where we are. Um, so I, I do agree with you. And I was hugely impressed by some of the work that was going on at McGee. I think it is absolutely fantastic. And I, in a couple of weeks, will be visiting Coleraine because I want to see the, the, the level of work and so on that's going on there. And of course, I also have an outstanding invitation to visit Queen's as well. So there's, there's plenty of work to be done, plenty for us to understand and take the thing uh, forward. Um, in terms of Brexit, you, you describe Brexit as a process, not an event. And in a way, that's absolutely true. I'm, I'm not denying that. But I actually think that after last Friday, the dynamic changed ever so slightly. So it wasn't a country leaving the European Union. It was a country now. We are now in a situation where the country has left. For us in Northern Ireland, no matter what you think about Brexit, um, we now need to actually get to a stage where we are working together to ensure that Northern Ireland has the best outcomes <coughs> from that. And whether that's protecting our um, access to the GB economy, holding um, the government to its promise of unfettered access to that economy, looking at the issues of the, the difficulties for business um, as we go forward, um, how we minimise barriers to trade um, within the British Isles as a whole. Um, those are all hugely, hugely important issues. And um, no doubt we will have many conversations over those issues. I also want to make sure that the government is held to account um, for its statements in um, the document around some um, funding to ensure that businesses are not unduly penalised because of additional bureaucracy or difficulties that they may face um, as a consequence of trading um, in the GB market. We cannot get away from the fact that it is our most important market. Um, we sell about 70% of everything we sell, or, or make or grow or produce, is sold within the United Kingdom, so it's sold within um, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And about two thirds of everything we bring in here, either for manufacturing or for the high street, comes from GB. That's our most significant market. So we want to hold the government to account on that issue. We also want to hold the government to account on something that we shouldn't ignore or, or get away from, on the issue of access to EU trade deals going forward. That is also huge, or not EU, sorry, UK trade deals going forward. That is hugely, hugely important uh, for us as well, that we can partake, compete for business, and that our firms um, are enabled to take advantage of any of the opportunities that come our way. And as I said in the House um, earlier um, this week, I took part in the first um, UK trade forum um, with um, the Minister Connor Burns um, and with um, the ministers from Wales and Scotland and I think that there is a, a genuine concern across all of the devolved regions that these are issues um, that they are um, able to engage properly with the government on um, and that they are able to defend their the interests of their part of the United Kingdom. Um, so uh, that, that again is, is a huge issue. So Brexit, 
I think it is we're in a slightly different scenario, but it's it's uh, still important. My understanding going forward, and I spent some time on Friday morning before I left the European Parliament talking to UK officials in Brussels who will be responsible for the trade negotiation, some of whom obviously I've got to know over um, the years that I've been there. Um, and they see that as being absolutely hugely busy, about 10 different um, parts of that negotiation all running um, in parallel. It's, it's going to be a huge challenge um, for us as a devolved region to keep up with that. Um, but um, also, uh, they also um, were saying that those negotiations, whereas the, the withdrawal um, negotiations took, part, took place in Brussels, those negotiations will take part in London and in Brussels. So I think we want to ensure that we also have that seat at the table when things that are pertaining to us are being discussed, and particularly the protocol. Uh, and on that issue. Um, the Brexit subcommittee did meet on Tuesday and that is an attempt, uh, you talk about collaboration, and that is an attempt to try to draw together all the different strands. So obviously Mike and I obsess about the economy and about the things that, that are, 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 are there, but Department of Justice has considerable issues that it will want to address um, and that impact on our everyday life. Department for Infrastructure, for example, around ports, airports and so on, has considerable... So it's an attempt to try to draw that process together. Now, we're not pretending that that's an easy process, but we have embarked and set up a structure to try to do that, and I'm hopeful that we will be able to take that forward and the issues of Brexit in a more cohesive way because of that. Can I just ask one very quick supplementary very quick question? question? Because um, we have another four members still last, waiting to do, ask the minister <laughs> question. Do you have the, the required expertise within the department that can help support you in this very short transition period? Well, the transition period is um, extremely short, um, and um, the dangers in are absolutely apparent in a short transition period. But we are where we are, and I don't think that there will be additional time within the transition period. So we will have to try to make that work. I will leave it to Mike to, to talk about the, the expertise okay. that he has or um, hasn't got. Well, obviously, over the last couple of years, we've built up um, our expertise, and also we have established good links with external experts, um, and you know we've worked very closely with them in a number of our publications in recent years. And indeed, you're going to hear from some of the guys shortly. Um, what I would say is that there are areas that worry me, not just from a DFE perspective, from, but from an NICS perspective um, over the coming months. Obviously, um, in the EU exit world. Um, there's going to be a lot of legislation, for example, required, and I worry about you know, the resources we have to draft legislation, for example, in the energy sector, um, and, and also, you know, it's going to require a, a great deal of coordination between ourselves and DERA in particular, but also some of the other departments, as the Minister said, in bringing legislation to this committee and the other committees and through, through the Assembly in a very, very tight time frame. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, the, that's mm -hmm. probably my greatest worry in terms mm -hmm. of resourcing the legislative drafting side of things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Guy. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks, Minister, and thanks, uh, Permanent Secretary, for your very uh, useful first briefing. Um, no surprise, uh, there's one loose end I just want to tie up in respect of the Ulster University. Uh, it's been well covered, um, but I, I suppose it's a bit of a topical question because uh, last night uh, in our local Council in the North West, uh, Down Strand Council, uh, voted unanimously uh, to write to the executive to urge them not to approve the loan uh, for for the the um, the York Street uh, situation. Um, could you nice. give us an update as to? Uh, I know it's not particularly helpful. Could you give us an update in terms of whether such a loan would have any impact whatsoever? on the potential of McGee University? Um, well, the loan, the additional loan of £126 million is what's called financial transactions capital, and that's specifically to finish out the, the Greater Belfast development. And that funding is now needed in the absence of the previous assumptions that uh, EIB funding would be in place. Okay, So it's not you know, as if you could take this money from the Greater Belfast development and say, right, we'll use it elsewhere specifically for that. Um, 
it poses the question, if you don't give the FTC to finish out Greater Belfast development, what happens to that development? Correct. And then it, it poses some quite fundamental challenges for the university, as the Minister said in her opening comments. One of the things we'd probably like to do in, in a closed session is maybe talk you through some of the implications of that, but they'd be quite profound for the university. Yeah, and I think that's a very useful contribution because it, it isn't a case of uh, them and us, and we need to get away from that mindset. Right. Uh, it's a case of um, when all of Northern Ireland, do, uh, when, we, when Belfast does well, uh, London Ireland does well, but I think that when all of Northern Ireland does well, I think that's the aim of, of, of everybody, uh, certainly in this committee, and should be the aim of everybody in this assembly. Sorry, I was just going to say, well, it ties in into um, some of the earlier conversation around. The, the status of new decade, new new approach. For example, the ring fencing of the 60 million for the graduate yes. entry medical school, so, and then there's the wider McGee expansion there. So, you know, I, I mentioned that the 2016 business case said that the construction costs were 300 million. I don't know what the figure is now, but just think about you know this department's capital base lends somewhere in the order of 50 million. So, if you know the executive has a willingness to do something and there's additional funding ring fence, that's fine. You know, so look at it separately from FTC to finish out. The, great, the, the Greater Belfast development, which is a specific loan. Oh, and that, that's welcome for clarification. I think that what we need to ensure is that we do not have a replication of what happened uh, in other areas. Uh, so, so I think it is vitally important, with, with, you know, notwithstanding the fact that I am 100% uh, like colleagues around this table committed to ensuring that, that we have a first-class uh, university uh, campus in the northwest. Um, just, just to move on um, to, and we haven't touched on this, but it is a, an important issue around uh, city deals. Mm -hmm. uh, could we have just a brief update as to the current position around city deals? Um, and then I just have uh, one very small supplementary whenever I get that update as to the current position. So, um, city deals are an exciting new development. Um, I think an opportunity to um, bring economic development and focus economic development um, in uh, the areas uh, which are important. Um, just a, a, a fairly just sort of factual yeah. overview of where we are. Um, the Belfast uh, City Deal, uh, sorry, first of all, this department's um, responsibility for city deals um, is in the areas of innovation, digital, uh, skills and tourism so not everything in a city deal comes to this department just to, to make that clear but those are the areas mm -hmm. where we will have uh, responsibility so um, in terms of the Belfast region city deal 850 million um, it's, it looks like in the region uh, 350 million uh, from the UK Treasury so that is uh, very very significant um, we are expecting, we haven't received um, any uh, outline business cases as yet, but we're expecting to receive an outline business case for the Belfast Region City Deal um, from mid-February, end of February onwards. And no doubt we will come back to a conversation um, around that. So really important and an opportunity to leverage in other money for very important uh, projects within the regions. The Derry City and Strabane City Deal, 200 million ambition, 55 million from the UK, an additional 50 million from the Inclusive Futures Fund. Um, and uh, we need to look at how that is, is uh, augmented um, from uh, local funds here and indeed from the council in the region itself. So some uh, progress made on that. Mid South West, Oma Fermanagh, Mid Ulster, and ABC councils. No overall figure as yet in relation to the overall target, um, but um, 135 million um, around for that uh, huge area from the UK Treasury. Causeway Coast, no overall figure yet, but 35 million promised uh, from the UK government. So really, like really a great opportunity to develop the economy in innovative ways um, with significant money that has come from Treasury and augmented uh, at a local uh, base. Um, I think Mike might want to say something about the staffing in the department yeah. and the ability to Did work through all of those yeah. issues. Thanks Minister. Um, just a couple of points to flag up to the committee. Um, so. 
BFA's department will, will lead on four areas of the various city deal initiatives, um, innovation, digital, skills and tourism. So we're going to have quite a heavy role to play in the delivering on these four city deal growth fund packages. Um, and at the minute our estimate is somewhere in the order of about 800 million of city deal funding is going to flow through this department. That poses um, two questions. Um, how, how, how is this department actually going to deliver, monitor and approve that degree of expenditure in business cases? And if, if the RHI um, issue has taught us anything, you need to staff up to genuinely deliver and you know, give assurance that it's been spent right. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the first concern about we don't have any, any money for city deals in our budget at the minute. We don't have any staff really. We have no team set up. So it's where, where, where do we get the resources to do that, to deliver that against the expectations that are out there in the various councils? And the second issue that concerns me is we need complete transparency on the accountability of spending on this. So there are various models out there in, in for, for um, city deal proposals. The idea that, for example, the money flows through this department and just goes out into the councils and they can spend it without the department having an oversight or approval role is a bit of a concern. So we need to work with colleagues in the Department of Finance to be sure we have a, um, a, a very transparent system of approvals and accountability to the Assembly and where that money goes. Thank you. And uh, just a small supplementary, but I appreciate that this is a huge area and it's probably one of those areas which we may need to have a, a briefing on specifically. Yeah. We have already, so there we go. It's be prepared. Um, the, the, the question that I ask, and it's, I suppose it's maybe an unintended, uh, unintended um, consequence, uh, but many, you've touched on the ex expectations, Mike, and there's huge expectations, particularly within my own council area, that, that the city is going to deliver uh, a lot. Um, an example of a project, the, the Maritime Museum, and Minister, you touched on the Ebrington Barracks site. The Maritime Museum, an £11.5 million project, £5 million has already been committed uh, to that through the Heritage Lottery and through uh, the local council. Now, Tourism, uh, Tourism NA are now saying that, that, should be, that, that their funding should come from the city deal element. Our concern would be projects the likes of uh, the Maritime Museum, which were actually in play before the uh, city deal proposal came forward, those projects actually could now be in jeopardy because we could lose the other five million waiting for the city deal to come through. I uh, appreciate you may want to come back on that. Yeah. You yeah, know, I think that that's valid, valid, valid. <coughs> Mike has some detail on it, but yeah, we will come back to you Thank individually you. on it. Yeah, I know yeah. it's, it's an issue we're aware of, yeah. um, and we can come back to you in greater detail about uh, how we think that should be addressed. <laughs> and then a, a similar issue actually is in terms of duplication, where you have projects mm -hmm. in, in one city deal <laughs> initiative and also replicated elsewhere, so we could end up with city centres of excellence and a whole raft of things all over the place, yeah. doing the same thing, just displacing each other. Thank you. Thank you. John. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your presentation and also to your permanent secretary. <coughs> I want to return to <coughs> excuse me, Project Stratum. And in regards to the proposed investment from the private sector into this project, uh, what, what percentage or share is it in regards that the you're asking or the tender documents are asking from the private sector? Um, to be honest, we, we, we don't know because at the minute we're, there's a tender process underway, the open market review is underway, so we know what the public sector contribution is to it. And what we're, there, there's, um, there are a number of bidders mm. to competitive process. So until that bidding process is ended and we see who the successful bidder is, only then when we open the bidding package will we see what their proposed contribution is. But, but surely in, in, in the published tender documents, when you went out for expressions of interest, was there a parameter set in terms of we would like the, the private sector to come forward with? Yes, there was numbers of uh, considerations. So obviously the point that was discussed earlier about maximising the coverage mm. and also the speed parameters being over 30 megabytes per second. So th there was a range of issues that we would expect the, the submissions to cover. So, so uh, if I get what you're saying to me right, what you're saying to the private sector is come back to us with your best offer in the sense of we're putting 165 Five million pounds of public money on the table. How much are you prepared to put up? Yeah. So the, the better, the, obviously, the better that puts the most in terms of their contribution to the package. You would like to think would be the successful better. Okay. Um, my concerns in regards. It's always good to get investment into this, particularly an area where public representatives are continually lobbied on. 
in regard to broadband. But my main concern is this, that the private sector sits back, uh, public representatives be lobbied, public money is then put into that system, and the private sector profits from public money being put into uh, broadband, which again, then members of the public, the taxpayer, who's already paid for the investment, pay for it again in their monthly bills. How do we assure that uh, the taxpayer, the, the person who pays their monthly broadband bill, is going to get value for money for an investment they have already made? Um, I have to tread carefully here, yeah, obviously, understand. because um, the procurement exercise is underway. Mm -hmm. Um, what I would say is that um, maximising value for money in, in the, the procurement process is a central theme. I was going to say a key theme, it's a mm -hmm. central theme. Okay, um, and it, it might be better actually uh, uh, if we, we take this aside as one of the private sessions and we can walk you through the specifications of procurement, just to give you some assurance okay. that there is, there is a comfort there. Okay. Uh, OMR is underway. 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 underway at the minute, which mm. is why I'm, I'm reluctant to say too much about it. OK, I appreciate that. And, and just uh, one more question, maybe two, well, two questions. <laughs> the Minister will appreciate the second one. Uh, in relation to uh, the European Investment Bank withdrawing the support from the Greater Belfast Development by Austrian University, why did they? Uh, I'll leave Mike for that okay. one mm. before um, my time. I think it was because of the, um, the, the availability of financial transaction capital at a lower rate of interest. Okay, which now has become available. Yeah, they, they, they've had... Oh, sorry, the, so the, the, the investment bank was of the view that the financial transaction was the best way forward for it? No, no, no. The no. university, my understanding is that the university, when it realised that it could access the executive's financial transactions capital, mm -hmm. um, and it was at a lower interest rate, uh, you know, they, they, they thought it was a, the more commercial option to follow. Okay, so it was the university that withdrew rather than the bank that withdrew? Yeah. That's, okay. my under, that's my understanding. But. Okay, and finally, uh, Minister, I, I, you, you've recently answered a question for me, uh, which I, I welcome the answer you've given, in regards to the... Answered a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know. So I, I want to highlight uh, the proposal within the New Deal, or New Decade, New Approach, in relation to a feasibility study about a high-speed rail link between Belfast, Dublin and Cork. Yeah. And I raised the issue with you in regards to ensuring that that investment also benefits... <laughs> Uh, towns and communities along the route. For instance, and you'll know these towns quite well, in, in terms of Lurgan and Portadown and Central Craig Alvin, because I think it'll be a huge mistake if there's significant investment made in that high-speed rail link, if it doesn't economically benefit those towns along the route. So I'm just looking for further reassurance that that will be one of the issues you look at when your department is looking at the feasibility of this project. It will, um, and actually the... the a high-speed rail link um, between uh, Belfast and Dublin was not just part of the recent document, it was part of the DUP manifesto mm. as well. Oh, there we go. Um, <laughs> we haven't uh, read it. We haven't read it. <laughs> not the latest edition, though. No, no, no. Because for a growing economy, connectivity is absolutely key. So in order to uh, <coughs> grow the economy, you have to connect the places where people live and work and do their jobs. So broadband and a growing economy and high-speed rail links are absolutely key. Yes, I will absolutely give that commitment. Um, you know that I live in the area. It's where I'm from. Um, I would like to see areas where that passes through benefit uh, from such connectivity. Um, but uh, again, we're at the very, <coughs> very early stages of this. An enormous amount of work to do, but it is an exciting concept. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Claire. No, thank you, Chair. Uh, welcome, Minister, and congratulations <laughs> on your post. Um, you. If I may just pursue the, the McGee uh, issue just a, a, a little bit more, can I confirm the £60 million that's ring-fenced, is that for capital funding of the, the, the McGee Medical School? I think the bulk of its capital, from, from the top of my head, I think it's 45 and 15 breakdown, but I'm not sure if we can write back with the detail. But okay. I think it, so the, the business case that the Department of Health is currently considering, that's in relation to the resource funding that will be required to maintain the medical school year after year? I understand. I think so, yeah. And in terms of that funding, where will that come from? Will it come from the Department of Health or will it come from the Department of Finance budget? 
Um, that's to be agreed. It's oh, sorry, the, 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 the capital for economy, biggest source. Uh, no, that the resource. So if we were to, if we were to have an expansion of a medical. Presumably, it would be through this department, but uh, you know, I haven't seen enough detail on it. And are you anticipating that that would have any other impact on the other campuses within Northern Ireland? Because obviously, you know that. Mm -hmm. Budgets are finite, and what to, as I said, goes to the point earlier. But if your money is genuinely additional and ring fenced, it shouldn't have. So then you get into issues about, about displacement and how it interacts, for example, with, for example, Queens sure. and the provision of, of um, um, medical services yeah. in Queens. But, yeah. But again, that we need guidance from the Department of Health on that one, and the, executive, the wider executive, because it's, it's a. And what guidance are you expecting from the Department of Health? Is that around the, the need for, I suppose, extra nurses and? Yeah, so, so not just in context of where they are with their business case and the consideration of the business case, but the, what the wider ramifications will be for across Northern Ireland. Okay, and I suppose you will be looking at that in the context of the, the medical provision that we already provide in other universities. And That's okay. what the Department has. Can I just say that one of the things that we will have to do is to look at, at uh, the provision in a holistic way yeah. across Northern Ireland. I think that that is actually very important, not forgetting that this is identified as an executive priority, but we will have to, to, to look mm -hmm. holistically mm -hmm. at how we go forward. Yeah, no, and I think it's important to say, you know, I, I certainly do support, the, you know, that provision within the North West, and we, you know, we need to be mindful of not having everything in Belfast, as if you like. Um, but I'm also concerned that it will have impact on other universities, and I would be keen to ensure that it's looked at in a holistic way, as you described, so yeah. I do, I, I do welcome that. Um, to come on to the um, RHI, um, in the New Decade, New Approach deal, there is a commitment from the two governments that they anticipate closing that scheme down. Is that something you support, Minister? Um, I suppose I'm mindful in the sense of the hardship that it may bring to some of the farmers who, as you, from the outset of your contribution, said in good faith, they applied to the scheme. I think sometimes we forget in the media that the scheme is always intended to raise revenue for farmers to help supplement their agricultural businesses. And given that agriculture is one of the probably biggest industries in Northern Ireland, it does concern me on the impact that the sudden closure of RHI um, would have. Um, I, I appreciate that maybe new claimants wouldn't be appropriate, but um, you know, indeed the people who did sign up to it in good faith, as you had said, um, is it something that you would support closing that down? Well. Can I, I could just sort of you touch on something that is very close to my heart. I've spent a lot of time over the last number of years as part of the Agriculture <coughs> Committee of the European Parliament and supporting and, and talking to local farmers. So and actually the, the food business in Northern Ireland is one of our great success stories um, and something that we as a committee um, will seek to support in the department and I hope the committee will seek to support in the future going forward. So it's really, really core to our economy and, and key, not just um, with farm families, but in the processing side as well. So I'm excited to, to, to get involved in, in, in that particular issue. Now, um, RHI, the, the New Decade New Approach actually said um, that we should look at closing this. What I intend to do is to bring forward all of the options to the executive so that the executive has a i don't want us to look at this in five years time and say we should have done this that or the other we are going to take a little bit of time and bring forward all of the options so that we're looking at all of the options in relation to the scheme um the scheme is complex to say the least um and that there there are um, issues uh, that are ongoing um, in relation to the current scheme. However, the current scheme is closed, so there are no new applicants to the scheme. Mm -hmm. The scheme is closed. Um, but there are issues within that um, that we must be mindful of as we are taking um, any of the options forward. So, um, you know, there is the issue of the hardship review. There is the issue of the tariff review after the Northern Ireland Select Committee report. Um, those are all issues that are due with us fairly soon um, to report back. Um, there's the issue of the voluntary buyout scheme, which uh, closed in the autumn of, of last year. And how do we actually manage to make the thing fair, both to the farmers, yes, mm -hmm. and to taxpayers? Um, people who acted in good faith should not be punished, but taxpayers must be sure that their money is well spent and transparently spent. I intend to play an absolutely straight bat in this. We will um, decide and look at all of the options and decide the best way forward.
Absolutely. Um, I think there was a suggestion in the House of Lords that the RHI scheme could be taken back to Westminster. Is that something that you know could be an option for the executive? Well, we look at all the options. Not something that I'm uh, currently <coughs> considering um, at all. Um, but we'll, we'll certainly look um, at all the options. Um, and bear in mind that you know while we're doing quite well in terms of generating energy uh, for electricity from renewables, we're not doing very well in ger terms of generating or decarbonising mm -hmm. our, our, our heat. So we will, we will need um, not just to deal with what we have in front of us, but to how we actually proceed in the future. Mm -hmm. And above all that, we want to, I want to do, make sure that it's done transparently with value for money, but with the aim in any new scheme of making sure that we are reducing our carbon footprint. Um, last year. Um, I'm really pleased to hear your comments around um, uh, leave for the loss of a child. I think that's yeah. really incredible, and I, you know, I, I look forward to see how, how that plays out. Um, can I maybe ask that when you're taking that work forward, you potentially look at birth trauma alongside that? I appreciate because in some circumstances, women are trying to deal with the with the difficulties of birth trauma, and then they're losing, you know, part of their maternity maternity leave in, in order to bond with their child. Um, so maybe it would be something that you might want to consider as, as I, part of that work? I certainly will consider it, but I don't want to delay. Yeah, no, any, you know, if, if we get into a situation where we have to do research or work around mm -hmm. that particular issue, and I accept that that is an issue, um, I think I don't want to delay that mm -hmm. in order. So I don't, I'm not given any commitment to link the two. Yeah. I'd like to see um, the bereavement um, issue dealt with. I as I said before, I couldn't believe in a <coughs> progressive modern democracy that we actually didn't have yeah. anything <coughs> in law mm -hmm. to protect people in this way. Um, so I'm, I'm, I want to make sure it comes in as quickly as we can do it. Um, but I certainly will look at the other issues. Mm -hmm. And if you want to write to me about yeah, those yeah. particulars, because I think that it is really important that employment law is fair mm -hmm. to employers and employees, but that it also has compassion and flexibility. Mm. And I suppose separate but maybe in a similar vein also add to that <coughs> childcare. You know, I think it's one of the biggest difficulties for particularly oh, mothers but fathers as well. You know, and I would really like to see, you know, if, if you do have time in the short mandate that we have left to potentially look at childcare options so that we can, you know, have uh, more options for particularly women being able to go out to work. Well, you know, we want to get as many people into the workforce as yeah. we can. So therefore having options in relation to childcare is hugely, hugely important and something that we will consider along with the many, many other priorities. But it is, an, it is a priority. It's a real issue for, for working families who find that actually childcare prices them out of work. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is a real issue. So mm -hmm. it is something that is on my radar and something that we will consider. Um, going forward, but it is an absolute, and thank you for raising it, because it is actually impacts on families right across Northern Ireland and is very, very important. Thank you. And can I just pick up on, on the comments around, around the, the RHI as well? Um, and in, we, I think we all understand the, the complexities of what, what, is, what is there. Um, but of course, what it says in New Decade, New Approach is bringing forward a new scheme which effectively cuts carbon, and there are question marks over the the effectiveness of, of RHI as it stands in terms of cutting carbon and the carbon neutrality of wood pellet in terms of, of that. So I think that in terms of the new energy strategy, we need to be considering that very carefully. Yeah. Gordon. Gordon. Gordon, and then yes, yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Chair, and uh, welcome, Minister, to your new post. <laughs> it's been a long session. We'll not keep it much longer. Mike, we welcome you and we look forward to working with you and uh, with this committee. Just on the, the university thing, which we covered quite a bit last week, the Ulster University, we all want to see the Ulster University succeed in Belfast. There's a huge investment there. But I think there is great concern out there about um, how the procurement processes were managed within the university. And we're now looking, they're now looking for a £126 million loan. Isn't that right to... Yeah, further, further loan. Yeah to address the issues. Further on, following on from our discussion last week, um, it was highlighted that they did not, they do not um, follow the DFA procurement processes that many other government agencies do and encourage to do. I understand there are various reasons for that, the university 
and in the standalone in, in many areas. But um, going forward, I think we need to get an assurance that this will not be, there'll be no recurrence of this in the future. And, um, you know, we all are, are very much aware of this. There's been a weakness in government departments throughout, in fact, throughout the UK and huge organisations. The procurement processes have been weak and found to be wanting. So what assurance can you give us uh, that there will be a review, a major review in relation to this and that this type of thing will not reoccur again in relation to uh, procurement projects for universities? Um, <coughs> thanks, Gordon. Um, Mike will speak to the general procurement issue, yeah. um, which I, th I think is valid and very, very important. Um, and we intend to review what actually happened at the Ulster University to lead us to this particular situation um, so that we can make sure and have confidence going forward that it doesn't happen again. So there will be a specific review. Okay. Just to add that um, obviously Heather Cousins, um, when she was engaging last week, highlighted some of the procurement problems when the university was self-managing the procurement process. and. Indeed, those issues have already been highlighted by the Audit Office in, in their major projects paper. Um, so, yes, there's concerns around the, the procurement of the project by the university um, and then the, the, the financial management of the project thereafter. So, as the Minister says, you know, they're, they're one of the conditions will be the taking forward of a, quite a fundamental review in both the financing and the capability of the project to the state to make sure it doesn't happen, you know, finishing out. And it will be an issue, obviously, I suspect, that the Public Accounts Committee will want to look at as well going forward. But will there be a, a fundamental change in their processes that this cannot happen again in further projects? I would have thought that's a key concern for the university's uh, governing body, the governing council. I would have thought would make sure this doesn't happen again. OK. Um, tourism, just on the tourism, what I think, I see we have uh, the draft tourism strategy in progress. Can we have a commitment um, in relation to event tourism? If we look at the open and so on, we talked about this last week, but um, when you go to tourism and and you know, to talk about events and smaller events, they tend to move away from that. And I still would be one that would feel that we need to be strong in promoting event tourism. If we take the open, for example, uh, the success of that obviously is a significant investment. We all recognise that. There are other events that are being looking at. We talked some time ago about the, the Rugby World Cup, um, and which didn't develop. Uh, I'm also aware that there's a bid for the, the World Rally Championship bringing it back here to Northern Ireland. So we would like some sort of commitment within the strategy that, we, that there will be support for events like that in the future. One of the, the commitments uh, within uh, the recent deal is to promote Northern Ireland through um, the staging of major events uh, within Northern Ireland, and that is part of, of uh, what we will be looking to deliver upon. Just in relation uh, to the Open, um, this was the first time we had uh, staged such a huge international, really massive event uh, of this kind. Uh, for many, many years <coughs> in Northern Ireland. Um, it had an attendance of 237,750 people. Absolutely phenomenal. And I know because I did it, um, the actual um, ferrying of those people to and from the event, because I parked the car and got the bus in, was actually really quite phenomenal. So. Um, I mean, we must say congratulations to those who delivered a, an event that ran as smoothly as it did and had that level of numbers um, in, involved in it. About 57,000 of those spectators were from outside Northern Ireland. That is a massive contribution to the local hospitality um, sector and to the hotel sector in Northern Ireland. And it generated a combined economic benefit of 100 million to the local economy, and that is the success of the Open um, as was delivered. So huge congratulations to those who spent, I'm sure, many, many wakeful hours worrying about and setting up the, <coughs> the yeah. arrangements for it. So therefore, there is a commitment in that 
um, around um, staging further um, big international events to promote Northern Ireland. And I think that that is hugely, hugely important. But not just about promoting Northern Ireland, remembering the economic benefit. And of course, events like the Open just don't have a one-off economic benefit. It will have a reoccurring economic benefit where um, the course is now um, a part of the, 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 the to-do courses. Uh, for those people who are golfers, I am not, by the way. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, um, it, it's huge. So yes, um, but of course, remember staging international events um, and making sure that those events happen and are attracted to Northern Ireland um, costs significant amounts of money. Um, and that is one of the things that we will be looking at over the next number of months um, within uh, the, the deal to see how we finance some of the commitments that are, that are within the deal. Okay. But yes, an absolute commitment, huge success and um, a great boost for Northern Ireland economically and in every other way. Okay. Um, one other issue we talked about last week was R&D funding, a challenge in the, <coughs> in the future, how that's going to be funded. It is <coughs> critical to the success of business and mansion manufacturing. It's key. And, and I, we are very much aware of the amount of uh, significant funding that was drawn down uh, so we talked about a rise in 2020 and so on. Uh, so how is that going to be addressed in the future and what is going to be done to promote, further promote R&D and, and innovation? Well, can I, I just, uh, this is a hugely, hugely important topic that we're getting to in the kind of last breath of the, of the um, session and one which we maybe will come back and talk and we can talk um, in session about it um, because a huge amount of money both for um, ASF or skills and training um, and ERDF for um, research development um, comes into Northern Ireland via um, European funds. Um, government has proposed a UK prosperity fund um, and we need to see fairly soon um, how um, that uh, pans out for the regions, what the volumes of money are in that, what the uh, ambition of that is and whether there will be like an overall umbrella structure and then regional um, divergence and input to suit regional economies and all of that um, is uh, to be worked out. And that is something that actually is a, a very, very high priority mm -hmm. um, as we uh, progress forward. In terms of research and innovation, um, Horizon 2020 and its predecessor um, in Europe provided uh, significant funds uh, for Horizon 2020, or for research and innovation. Um, sometimes I think that um, we assume that because we have left the European Union that we cannot take part in those um, programmes. But of course we can take part as a fully aligned country or as a third uh, party. So um, many countries, um, I recently um, was in Israel, um, and in FP7, the forerunner to Horizon 2020, they were one of the most successful countries in drawing down research and innovation funding and working with the European Union um, to advance research and innovation. So I'd really like to see us being able to be part of a future um, Horizon uh, 2020 or whatever comes after it uh, programme. Um, I'd also like to see us uh, invest and grow our own research and innovation programmes, both within the United Kingdom and in collaboration with other countries. I think that that is the way to go. No one has the monopoly and knowledge and collaboration across um, sectors and across countries is very important. I just mentioned just a, a, a really um, Another one that's um, close to my heart, Erasmus, um, is another European fund. I, again, would like to see us um, being able to be part of that Erasmus programme going forward. I have long um, had a bit of a bee in my bonnet about Erasmus in, in many ways, and that sometimes it's seen as the prerogative of university students to be able to go and have a year out and travel around Europe. Now, that's lovely and that's great, but I would really, and 
an issue which I champion in the European Parliament. I really want to see Erasmus open and available to all. So it was one of the things I loved doing was making sure some of our, our young people who were um, doing uh, apprenticeships within the building industry were able to link up with apprentices, for example, in northern Germany to actually do that. Um, I think there, there is no reason why we cannot continue. I noticed a, a tweet from Kilcooley Women's Centre this uh, earlier in the week, um, where, um, and you will know them very well, Gordon, and yeah. they're off uh, on another Erasmus journey, um, and um, they're, they're linking up with um, countries like Turkey and so on that are outside the European Union, but that participate within the programme. So these are all issues for the future. Um, and issues that we can discuss about how best we take this forward, but it's opportunities that we shouldn't lose. Great. Thanks, Minister. Thanks, Meg. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. I just want to come back just on the UU um, issue, and uh, this section of our proceedings is being hand sorted. Yes, that we right? are sorted. It is right. So, to be absolutely clear, the 126 million FTC going to the UU in Belfast is unrelated to and has no impact upon UU at McGee. The ask for 126 million of financial transactions capital is from the Ulster University to finish out the Greater Belfast development. Yes. And the result of the actions being suggested by the local council, uh, that this should not be granted approval, the result of them getting their way would be what? Well, if the financial transaction capital doesn't go to Ulster University, then they don't have the financial resources to finish out the project. So you'd be sitting with a half-finished campus? Or they, they would have to try and find it elsewhere. You'd be but sitting with a half-finished campus in Belfast? That would be a conclusion you would draw. But be absolutely clear, that is not our intention. No. No. Be absolutely clear. Our intention is to see that we have a world-class site in Belfast that benefits our young people and our students and grows them in whatever way that we can, but also grows the economy of Northern Ireland and benefits us all, educationally, culturally, and in every way. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very um, prolonged <laughs> briefing. Um, and I think there are a number of issues that we, we probably will be wanting to yeah. talk to you more about, and we will take up the offer of the, the briefing sessions yeah. as well. So thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. I look forward um, to our continued cooperation. Um, I am perfectly prepared for scrutiny and robust conversation, but I think this is very, very helpful for us all to take forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're moving on then to item number five, which is our departmental briefing from the EU exit meeting. Um, members will recall at the initial evidence sessions from the department, we agreed to seek a further briefing from the EU exit group. Um, there is a memo at page 98 of your pack, and there are slides from the department for the EU exit preparation at page 100. Um, some of the other information that we requested is being prepared by, by the department, so I'd like to work, welcome the group to, to the meeting and if you maybe want to introduce yourselves. Yes. Uh, thank, you much, Chair, and, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to come back and give you a brief. Just, before we get into it, just reiterate the Minister's comments on offer to brief the committee. I know this is a particularly complicated area um, and we're more than willing to work with you guys. I know that the Dallows had initial conversations with the clerk about um, how we might take that forward. Um, let us know what would work for you, and we're more than happy to um, take that. Uh, you, know, you can come to Nadia or to Adelaide and we can be more focused in that briefing, or you can call us back and do these types of sessions. We'll have to take your stay. So, the colleagues uh, I've brought along with me uh, today represent th three of the four directors in the group. Uh, so, I have uh, Julian Eagle Quintig, who is the director in charge of the protocol. Mary, immediately to my right, um, is responsible for the department's readiness, and then Victor, on the end, is on the trade and migration aspects of it. Uh, the fourth director is Shane Murphy, who's the chief economist, who is not here today, but I I'm sure in, in time he'll present the, the work of the analytical services division. So, Chair, as you mentioned, we provided a slide pack with you. In the interest of time, we weren't going to go through the slides individually. Um, we were going to provide a high-level overview from each of the divisions and then uh, give members the uh, most amount of time possible to question and get into the detail. Um, so, firstly, just to start off with an overview, obviously the UK has left the, um, the European Union. Um, as the withdrawal agreement includes a transition period, um, 
vast majority of people and businesses, both here and across the UK, won't have seen a material change. Um, although it's not visible or tangible, um, the 31st of January does represent um, a reset of the clock. So the transition period is a defined amount of time, which the, the Minister referred to earlier on, and it's UK government policy not to extend the transition period. So our new deadline <coughs> that we're working to is the 31st of December uh, 2020. This provides a limited amount of time, uh, which we're aware of, to do a, a large and complex series of negotiations. So in the, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, we talked about how the group is structured to, to place into the negotiations, and that's the representation here. So. In this next year, the UK government will need to negotiate the implementation of the protocol and operationalise them arrangements for the 1st of January next year. We will need to establish a new economic relationship with the EU, so this is the Future Economic Partnership, also referred to as the FEP. Um, at the same time, it will need to establish new relationships with third country partners, so an independent trade policy. Mm -hmm. Separately, there are a number of decisions it will have to make unilaterally of powers returning from mm. Brussels, uh, where UK government now has autonomy uh, over things like migration policy, for example. So in the slide pack, we make the point that these are all heavily connected, so a decision in one area will have material impacts in another, so it's quite a dynamic and fast-paced environment, and the colleagues inside me will give into more detail of, of those individual issues. So before we moved on into um, their briefing and, and sort of uh, pausing on what the Minister said as well, I wanted to um, just draw attention to the commitments that UK Government have made. So on slides uh, eight and nine in your pack, We've provided you with um, uh, commitments that we think are material and, uh, and we think are important. So the first slide eight draws out those from the new decade, new approach, and then we've gone into statements that have been made on the House, so particularly <coughs> in uh, exchanges around the progression of the withdrawal agreement. And then um, uh, Sir Geoffrey Johnson asked a question in GameCues, which we thought was important. There. So, and the reason for pausing on that is really because those commitments, as the Minister said, really frame our work at the moment and exactly what we're doing and um, really understanding exactly how UK government is going to deliver on these commitments. So moving from, in some cases, a process. So for example, the UK government will legislate from vetted access. We, uh, what we're asking for now is more detail on the how. So rather than the process, exactly how will you uh, deliver on vetted access and what will that mean for online businesses? So I thought it'd just be helpful just to pause and share that point of detail. Uh, I'll now move on to Julia, who'll give you a, a brief update on the protocol. Okay. So um, as Paul said, my division covers um, the protocol and the impact that has on the economy. So the major policy decisions in this space, as you'll all be aware, are, are reserved. So issues like VAT, customs, manufactured goods regulation. So a major part of our job is trying to influence reserved policy areas and to ensure that development of reserved policy takes into account the major impacts these would have on the Northern Ireland economy. So the key issue as the Minister said, we're focusing on at the moment, and the key issue with the protocol in general is how it will impact trade with GB. So in, we're worried about trade in both directions. So in terms of sales, we know that it's a, it's a significant market for, the, for Northern Ireland businesses. So 48% of all external sales go to GB, and 68% of those were by companies in the manufacturing sector. So it's a really vital for, the, for externally selling and for exports. In terms of purchases, it's even more important. So 63% of all externally purchased goods were purchased from GB. And the most significant um, sector in purchases was the wholesale and retail sector, which accounted for 65% of the value. So the dominance of the wholesale and retail sector there makes us particularly concerned about the impact any, ch any changes or frictions would have on consumers and consumer prices. For both sales and purchases, the majority of the majority of both is done by micro and small businesses, and so it's a big concern for us to look at how any new any new processes or frictions, how would small or micro businesses be able to cope? Large businesses might have more capacity or experience in customs. Micro or small businesses may not have that experience. As the minister is well, there's a great deal of uncertainty still on all of this. Um, all is said. The, UK government has made commitments around unfettered access. We will be waiting in the, the months ahead. We'll bring significant decisions in terms of the joint committee, how trade from especially GB2NI will work. And so 
they're aware with all this uncertainty, it's really difficult for businesses to prepare. And as Paula said, the time frame is very short already. And so taking out time for decisions to be made, it just gets shorter and shorter. So we're aware of the need to work together on this with the business community and with uh, stakeholders. Because firstly, we need to ensure we know all the issues and are raising those appropriately. So we do it through, um, we have a DFE stakeholder group um, and we also do some business engagement just to make sure we're aware of the key issues for business and can feed those back. Um, and we'll also be working closely with um, our ALBs, so Intertrade and Invest and I, to help businesses to prepare. Uh, finally, just we, the executive as a whole will be aware of the need to develop mitigations to all of this and, as the Minister said, to make sure our businesses aren't penalised due to the impact of all of this. That work is at an early stage and it's being led by DOF. Um, uh, you'll be aware there's a significant uh, dependence between the uncertainty and developing policies to mitigate that. So, um, so that's an overview of my division. I'll hand over to Victor. Thanks, Julia. Um, so Victor Duclo, head up uh, international trade and migration issues associated with uh, EU exit. And just wanted to cover three particular areas within that briefly, if I may. Um, first of all, responsibility for DFE's engagement on uh, future relationship between the UK and the EU. So we've heard quite a lot this week about all of that, with mandates being published, Prime Minister's statement uh, around the UK position, um, and some tensions being flagged up uh, in all of that. Um, but whatever, I think, is made of all those opening uh, positions as, as negotiations, what will be, and uh, the Minister has already pointed to a tight timeline for, for negotiations, potentially, the outcomes of those will be particularly uh, important for Northern Ireland, uh, for us, um, important for how our trade works uh, with GB, and we've already heard some of the commitments that have been made uh, by UK government uh, in all of that in terms of unfettered access, uh, but also important for how our trade and services in particular uh, operates on a north-south basis and how our service providers, uh, in, in terms of that tradable service element, uh, operates with the UK or the EU uh, more widely. So critical. Um, real challenge, I think, around just the complexity of this agenda and the timelines with which it will be t uh, undertaken. So critical that we engage and make sure that the Northern Ireland interests are, there are avenues to build those in and that they are reflected uh, as best as, as we can uh, secure that. Um, have responsibility for engagement on international trade policy issues. So the first one around uh, negotiations with the EU. This very much about the UK's engagement with the uh, rest of world uh, countries and trading blocs. The UK has an ambition ensuring that 80% of its external trade is covered by free trade agreements by 2022. So again, uh, a heavy ambition <coughs> there. Uh, but within that, they've said that their trade policy must work for, for England, for Scotland, for Wales, and importantly, that it must work for us uh, here, uh, and particularly important that it must work for us in the context of the protocol. Um, we're keen to seek, uh, you've heard our minister say this already this morning, uh, keen that we hold the, the UK government to that commitment and the other commitments that it has made uh, to Northern Ireland, to our stakeholders and to our people uh, here. Um, so considering forging new trading agreements across the globe, including uh, with the US as a, a key uh, priority, much has been made of that. Um, in a commitment within the new decade, new approach, um, that uh, we here should have access to those free trade agreements. Uh, so we again have to ensure that as we engage in that, we're reflecting the interests of our people uh, and businesses and the impact of that agenda on our competitive position uh, as uh, business, uh, you know, our business's competitive position, both in the GB marketplace, which is something that's been reflected on already, uh, but more broadly uh, through our access uh, to those free trade agreements. And then finally, 
uh, have responsibility for migration issues from a DFE uh, perspective. Right from the outset, uh, Northern Ireland businesses have been really clear that this is an absolutely critical issue for them in terms of their uh, competitiveness. Uh, you know, really key that they continue to have access to skills, uh, to labour. Compared to other parts of the UK, we have a particular reliance on EU workers. Uh, sectors like manufacturing, agri-food, we've heard about the tourism and hospitality bit already. Uh, social care sector is really important uh, as well, relying on EU uh, migrants. People have chosen to come here to live, to work, to enrich our society uh, here. Important that we now work uh, to ensure that UK immigration policy uh, operates in a way that uh, you know, is, is, uh, can resonate with the needs of uh, Northern Ireland um, and that the policy approaches that they take are in full recognition of the evidence uh, of uh, impact and uh, utilisation uh, and all that goes with that. So I think um, in all of this work, I suppose, we'll be judged by the outcomes uh, rather than the activity, but I think there is some evidence where traction has been made. We heard... Uh, from the MAC report that was announced uh, last week, uh, and our minister referred to a salary recommendation that has been made there of 25,600 rather than the 30,000 that had been made previously, but also they make the case that Northern Ireland, particularly if it's operating uh, under the protocol, uh, it may need further consideration in terms of that. So that's, a, again, I think an angle a door uh, that we need to continue to, to knock on, and our minister has made the point that she's very keen uh, to, uh, to do that. So that's all I wanted to say. If I can pass on to Mary. Yeah, thank you. Mary MacGyver, I'm responsible for the readiness of the department uh, for exiting the EU and transitioning into a deal. Um, we've heard a little bit about um, the readiness of business stakeholders, the readiness of the economy, the department itself with its policies and its strategies and the services it delivers and its ALBs also need to be ready. Um, we've obviously been preparing um, for a number of years um, and very recently the preparations have changed because we now have, we now have the uh, withdrawal um, assent um, withdrawal agreement assent and we now <coughs> the, the, uh, the preparation phase. So the department has now set up a readiness board um, which is due to meet for its first meeting next week and the uh, issues there are about how ready are we across the department um, in terms of legislation, in terms of our policies, in terms of where the normal business intersects with the developments in the EU, the protocol, um, all of those will have impacts in various forms across different policy areas in the department. Um, so part of the work of the readiness board will be a, a sub-board of the actual departmental board, chaired by the permanent secretary with the leadership team, um, really to oversee uh, the developments, uh, the readiness, are we fit for purpose, how are we going to deal with uh, the absence of EU funds and the introduction of the new uh, shared prosperity fund? Um, how are we going to deal with the legislation? What legislation needs to be changed? There's, there has been, in terms of the, the no deal preparations, a significant number of SIs put through. We now need to, to, to assess those SIs again because they were for no deal. Do they need to be changed? Um, what is the impact of the protocol? We may not always be aligning um, with the SIs going through the UK because of the protocol, so what is that? So really there's a lot of detailed work, as Paula said, in terms of the preparation. So the first meeting of that board actually is next week, and we look forward obviously to briefing you in more detail um, in terms of preparation as we go forward. Okay, that's all we were going to say at the opening uh, comments and remarks. We're happy to take questions on the slide pack or anything that uh, we've said. Brief updates. Thank you for, for all of those um, briefings, and I'm sure over the next few months we'll probably be seeing quite a bit of you. Um, there's a few things I just wanted to, to pick up on. Um, obviously, as, as <coughs> you outlined, so much of all of the things that we need to prepare for are, are very much dependent on the trade agreement that, that is 
or is not negotiated over the next few months. Um, and it is there is obviously that frustration with business that they, they find it very difficult to, to plan for that. Um, and it is good to hear about the stakeholder group and the engagement that is ongoing. And um, I think, if anything, just to, to stress the, the, the need for the continual um, sharing of information, whatever it is, uh, as it becomes available, so that business can take whatever steps that there is possible to take at this point. Um, if I could just ask a question, obviously there is the, the commitment from the British government in New Decade, New Approach, to legislate to guarantee unfettered access. Do we have any timeline around when they intend to do that or how they intend to do that? No, uh, no not at this stage. Um, they haven't, um, haven't set out a timescales for that. Obviously, because the points you make at the start are, are, are valid and, and reflective of our assessment as well, is that the quicker they're able to do that, the quicker we're able to provide businesses with certainty in this particular issue of the, those that sell into the GB market, the better. Uh, and I know that so the Minister has raised this uh, uh, with executive colleagues and, and pressed the importance of it. And I, I think from the Orwells yesterday, the, the FM mentioned that uh, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister are writing to the PM on this issue as well to, to press that point. Um, Timescales are important, but also I think the substance of it is really important. So mm -hmm. unfettered access is... Um, uh, uncertain at best. Um, I think when we speak to businesses, they explain to us, look in real terms, what does that actually mean? So it means no tariffs, no discrimination, no regulatory barriers, no dual authorisation. So getting that actual practical detail from yeah. the UK government uh, is the, the point I made at the commitments. It's an, not a process, but you know the, the how. Yeah, I think the, the actual understanding of what they mean by unfettered yeah. access and, and how um, that has been interpreted is, is really key. Um, there was points made around um, the the, um, the MAC and the, the immigration policy, um, and obviously in terms of the protocol to um, frontier workers, those who cross the border to work, um, who may be from other EU states, um, and the need to address that going forward, has that been given consideration? Yeah, absolutely, and it's something that we've been raising heavily with the Home Office and something that they are... Uh, we believe they're looking at um, to see as this all moves forward in terms of the, the withdrawal agreement, how they can continue to be uh, protected. So it is um, there. You know there are some protections in there so long as you remain as a frontier worker in a sense that you can have that status that you can continue to uh, operate. But there's broader issues that I think we need to. Um, engage with around all of this if you have you know if you're from a, an EU country you're providing a service mm -hmm. that has a cross-border dimension to it um, can you continue to provide that uh, cross-border service once the further trade negotiations have taken place and what if not what protections can be offered so there is a lot of issues to continue to to engage with there though absolutely it's something that we're we're raising as a priority okay that's good to hear and um, i think there's a lot of complexity there that that we we need to kind of detail out um and then just finally from myself um Obviously, we, the Minister picked up on it and some of the members as well around the, the future funding programmes and, and it was good to hear the Minister say that she is keen to see Erasmus continue and I know there will be a lot of people that will be really glad to hear that um, and it's something that's obviously going to, we need to work out how and everything else. But the, the, um, the, the Shared Prosperity Fund and the continued access to um, particularly the Research and Development Fund in the Horizon Europe going forward um, obviously, some of that is not entirely within our gift to, to control either, but I think it's just to, to, again, make the point about how important it is for our research and development that our, our universities and others are able to um, access Horizon Europe and as uh, to the best scale possible, uh, you know, like associated membership is one thing, but, you know, they are... Researchers have to have the ability to lead projects as well, and I think that that's something we just need to reinforce in terms of making the arguments around, yes, we want the best access to EU funding programmes. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a centrally coordinated exercise through colleagues in the Department of Finance, because obviously this is much broader than just the departments. Um, and 
our role feeding into that is, is the point that you make exactly, is that this isn't just about a quantum or a figure, it's demonstrating the importance of this funding economy uh, and making the case that if the Shared Prosperity Fund or the funding stream under deliver or, or don't um, have the same impact, then there are material impacts on the, on the economy. I think that's, that's, so while the uncertainty will remain, I think, I think what we can do in the interim is justify and make the case of why it's such an important aspect of the Norland economy that the streams are maintained, both internally, but also thinking about our competitiveness within yeah. these islands. Yes, yeah. and in particular in an all island context. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. John. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, in regards to the Prosperity Fund or scheme, I'm more worried about as to who David or uh, Boris Johnson is going to make prosperous rather than the fund itself. But that's not a question for yourselves. Um, I, I have to ensure that that Prosperity Fund is spread across those who need it rather than those who already have it. In regards to the GB market, which is obviously a huge market for uh, our businesses here. Is there any research or figures you can provide us with in terms of the supply chain? Yeah. Because we, we were looking at figures here in terms of what uh, is sold into the GB market, what's bought in the GB market. But obviously there's a supply chain there. And when you look at the, the, the economy across the island of Ireland, if I use milk for instance, the famous quote that a milk product can cross the border five times before it is the final product that is sold. Have you any figures you can supply us in regards to that? Um, not today, but um, so that, that research is in train, I think, in both directions. So mm -hmm. the extent to which yeah. uh, integrated all line supply chains uh, are in the manufacturing process for products that are then sold into GB is important for us as we come to define unfettered access for NI businesses, because if it's a, if that definition is centred on origin, um, any cross-border supply chains would complicate an origin definition, and then vice versa as well, as we're thinking about Northern Ireland purchases from GB, how many of them products are intermediate, and therefore, uh, from the EU's perspective, are at risk of moving into the single market, and uh, if tariffs apply, the EU is to uh, apply an EU tariff. So again, how many intermediate products could come into GB as part of a, a research programme that Shane, the, the chief economist, is developing. Uh, and we see that as forming part of uh, how we've interpreted the commitment and new decade, new approach for the executive to make an assessment of North, South and East, West relationships. From our perspective, that has to include something that looks a lot like an impact assessment on the Northland economy, of which that's a, a, a central tenant. Okay, uh, just one final question, Chair. The, the issue of uh, immigration and the, the wage level which has been set uh, by the central body. I, I was thinking about this the other day from a slightly different angle and I don't know the answer and that's why I'm asking the question obviously uh, but in regards we have a low wage economy here uh, which some tell you that it benefits the economy because you attract investors secure employment etc. But is there not a slight quirk to this. If central government sets the, the wages at the standard which has been uh, indicated, will that not force wages here to rise and therefore be a, a good thing for uh, workers in particular? Uh, and given that we'll be working in an economy which is then matched against uh, Britain and matched again uh, in terms of the south of the border, uh, that, that we actually this may actually achieve a goal which many have been working for for many, many years, a higher wage economy than one we currently have. Yeah, I mean, I, there's a lot of research that's been done on all of this, mm -hmm. um, and the MAC itself has brought out research which shows that you know, the impact of migration on the UK economy has been pretty negligible in terms of wage impacts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some, uh, you know, some schools of thought would have, would have suggested it would have pushed wages down. Um, the MAC aren't finding that, and yeah. other academics aren't finding that uh, either. And generally, there's a positive, you know, economic contribution that has been made uh, by the inflow of migrant workers. I mean, I think a point that has been made um, to the Home Office in terms of the evidence that we have provided is uh, sort of paint the picture like this. I think we're on a, an economic journey. Um, there is a, a clear 
if you look at our wage levels, we're still, you know, well below the UK level. I think our medium wage here uh, is you know, 23, 24,000 compared to about 29, 30,000 uh, the UK as a whole. So we are, and that's the private sector. Uh, so we are considerably uh, lower, but it has been growing. Um, we've been, we you know, have ambitions that have been set before around making sure that this is a skilled economy, high skilled, productive, competitive and all that goes with that. The core, I suppose, concern that we're hearing from stakeholders is that something would happen to set us off course, that there would be some kind of shock that could set us off course uh, in, in all of this. So that's the right, that still seems like the right ambition to have. Question is, if you start to lose access to skills and access to labour, what would be the implications for that? And there has been some indications that we have uh, received from uh, businesses and stakeholders that one of their reactions might be they would move, they would chase the labour to move, you know, let's say south of the border where there would be continued access uh, to skills uh, and, and people uh, for the, the work that they're conducting. So I think, you know, is there a clear answer we would see a, a significant rise in wages if there is a reduction in access to skills and EU. That's not what the research is telling us. I think. Uh, I think. And it, it, from, you know, I think the, the point that we need to make sure that we continue a positive trajectory for Northern Ireland is a good one to bear in mind in all of this. Just to clarify, I, I'm, I'm not sure you're making this point. But just to clarify myself, I'm not arguing that. Uh, Immigration drives down wages because I would never believe that theory. Okay, and that's not that's not the point I'm trying to make. So I just want to put that on the record. The point I'm making is that uh, if employers are forced to pay a higher wage for whether it's labour coming into the market or labour that's already in the market, that may be a good thing because it may uh, all boats rise in a high tide. And I'm wondering where the employers are going to go if they refuse to pay that higher wage because you go across the border. They have a higher wage rate than we have, and they have free movement. We are going to close down free movement to a certain degree, but also the, the island beside us is closing down free movement as well. So where is the employers going to go? They are going to have to pay the rate of which the employment market is demanding, in theory. Yeah. Gordon. Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much, all of you, for your presentation today. Mm -hmm. I take it you heard the news this morning that Danske Bank have made a profit of 19 million pounds pre-tax profit. How do you assess that in the, in the forecast of all those um, who reckoned that the implications of Brexit were going to have a very significant effect on the economy? I don't have the detail of Danske Bank's operating model. Um, is your point about whether um, is Brexit have a negative impact on the uh, economy? Is, is yeah, yeah, to date. If you, were, if you were to follow all the lines of the media over the last two to three years, which I'm sure you've yeah. done, yeah, absolutely. You know, last Friday night was to change everything. Yeah. We've had this announcement today, and we're, we're all aware, especially like the representatives, the implications or the perceived implications of uncertainty yeah. with, with the Assembly and with Brexit. And yet, those figures today, £90 million pre tax profit announced, I think it's significant. Yeah, worth absolutely. noting. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that so the point I made at the start is the UK left on the 31st of January, but the withdrawal agreement includes a transition period. So there's there's no material change for people's lives on the 1st of February. I woke up on Saturday morning and it was the same. Um, yeah, but you are aware of the all the implications of it, the perceptions are aware and talking yeah. to, to business sector. Absolutely. And then when we speak to businesses, uh, they press the uncertainty. And I think particularly if we're talking about investments, then um, uncertainty is an issue in terms of how that... But that there, I think that answers it. Right, um, in relation to documentation, say for the transfer of goods, there has always been a significant amount of documentation with the transfer of goods. If you take certificates of conformity, licences, various approvals, and a batch of goods, whether it, once it moves out of a depot, it has to be... Uh, it's controlled and everyone should know, those involved with it should know exactly what's, what's in it, <coughs> whether it's compliant and so on, and it is of the required standard. So do you really see that there will be significant changes to 
to cause and to time in relation to the transfer of goods, say from in relation from movement from Northern Ireland out. From Effa, so the NITGB and yeah, trade, trade between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Um, the point that we make in the slides is that the UK government have made commitments that there won't be significant changes. What we are asking for is then to demonstrate exactly okay, how can they guarantee to businesses that there won't be the administrative paperwork. If there are new costs, how will we ensure that businesses and consumers in Northern Ireland don't bear the brunt of them costs? That's the exercise and that's the journey that we're on at the moment. You would agree with the point that there is a significant amount of documentation already in place, and a lot of that now is IT based. So all this thing about delays and, and cost, I'm, I don't honestly find weakness fully justified. Part of the challenge we face is the uncertainty that the Chair made at the start, is that the, the context in which that trade will take place in is not known at this stage. There are a range of outcomes on the 1st of January next year that will materially and significantly impact upon whether uh, new processes, new paperwork may or may not be required. So, for example, um, a world in which the UK delivers on its negotiating objectives and agrees a, an ambitious trade deal with the EU, it's hard to see there would be many new processes required. If that ambition is not realised, then it becomes a different context, trade between Northern Ireland and GP. And in that world, there will be, our expectations are, the EU will expect certain assurances that products coming into Northern Ireland certainly meet EU trade policy. Uh, there's less concerns on the reverse trade flow from NI to GP because that's within UK government's gift. So if, if processors and manufacturers are to continue to work to the standards as, as they have at the moment, do you see any significant risks to, to, their, to the markets in outside of the UK? Um, so in terms of so a Northern Ireland manufacturer is yeah, producing they, the ones continue, yeah. yeah. Northern Ireland processors, a lot of it's processing yeah. isn't it, rather than manufacturing. <coughs> We're talking about, in fact, a lot of manufacturing. There's very little real manufacturing done because a lot of that's assembly. Yeah. Um, so sort of if they continue to work to the same standards, say in relation to quality requirements and yeah. EU approvals at the moment, if they continue to do that, do you see any significant risk in relation to trade, trade outside the United Kingdom in the following next year? Uh, so businesses in Northern Ireland that trade with the EU won't yeah. see any change because uh, they'll continue to apply the same standards that you're talking about. Uh, for businesses trading into GB, I think uh, what the withdrawal agreement process revealed and the amendments that were tabled by Northern Ireland MPs were concerns that unfettered access as a statement doesn't give the, the sufficient assurances. So um, a, a number of the amendments talks about preventing discrimination of NI products in the GB marketplace. So that may still happen even if uh, products are um, uh, made to the same standard. And then there are also concerns around the customs regime. So what, um, what are the implications of Northern Ireland operating a different customs regime to the rest of the UK? And how does that affect trade between the two, two areas? So there are all factors? Yeah, yeah, I think that the way we see it at the minute, that there are known risks on the table. Um, you'll speak to experts, documents that were um, released from the UK government uh, put those known risks out there. We're aware of them. At the same time, we've seen UK government commitments that they see a path to work through them risks. What we're asking for is more detail on how do they overcome them obstacles to ensure that businesses here can continue to trade with its biggest market in both directions. Okay. And how do you continue to um, liaise with the Northern Ireland business representatives? Your department? Yes, yeah, so I think I mentioned last time that there's a, a departmental stakeholder forum. That is our main vehicle for... Um, uh, interacting with the business community. Who heads that up? Who heads up the forum? Who chairs it? So either myself or Mike chairs the forum. Right. And how often does it meet? Um, we're in the process of arranging the next meeting now, so the, the minister is keen to be there at the first meeting. I think that's appropriate with the new ministers coming back, so um, the guys are in the process of arranging that forum now. OK, so there's commitment right from the top level. Absolutely. The Minister's very keen to engage. I think you saw that sort of sentiment, sort of uh, that collective uh, approach to this um, uh, coming straight from the Minister. And I think uh, important, I think, for the business community to get that level of access. And I think the Minister's keen to, to listen to their concerns. I think the, 
the, the number of issues and the range of complex problems here is significant. We don't have a monopoly of the solutions. I think the only way we'll be able to work through this is working with the committee, but also the business community to see what works for them in practical terms, and then that informs what the executive will consider as a, uh, an ask to the UK government or indeed to the European Union. And is agriculture represented on that body? Uh, so officials from DERA attend, and then there are members of the agri-food industry that also come along as well. Good. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose one of the points you made was is that a considerable number of businesses that trade across um, the, the Irish Sea are SMEs, um, and I suppose they've, given their nature and their size, they're probably most vulnerable in terms of the information that's getting provided. Um, I, 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 I note that you say that you, you are encouraging engagement, but how successful and how effective are you in, in being able to do that? You know, I'm, I suppose I'm concerned that a number of SMEs that are obviously going to fall through the net, given, you know, given maybe they don't have the same uh, networks as, as others might. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a concern just because of the nature of it. I think um, you look at the micro businesses employing less than 10 people, the bandwidth of these businesses is limited. I think if we use our approach to no deal as an example of how I think we'll approach it next time, is we'll rely heavily on our arms and bodies. So, Intertrade mm -hmm. Ireland and Invest Northern Ireland have the contacts in the business community. Uh, mm -hmm. And also, we reached out to the councils because councils sort of yeah. uh, know the businesses in their area. So, use um, those existing contacts to try and reach out. I think also the trade bodies, so the likes of CBI, IOD, Chamber of Commerce, are also instrumental in getting that message out uh, as best as possible. Mm -hmm. I think we're, uh, we're not there yet because it's, it's um, I think certainly our, our lesson from No Deal was that businesses want information and they um, you know, understandably get frustrated if government officials come to them without anything to say. Yeah. They need to be able to go to them with a, a clear action plan uh, yeah. as soon as possible. Yeah, no, I, is there anything more that we could do? And I don't even know if it's possible. Could we, you know, could you go through HMRC or something and get their business number? I, I, I just suppose I, I appreciate that there are various conduits and the likes of CBI and all of that, but in my experience, a lot of small businesses, particularly micro businesses, wouldn't necessarily be engaging with those because that adds an extra burden and cost. Yeah. So it's not, you know, providing the right channel. Um, you know, how are we getting to those businesses that maybe have one or two members who maybe are somewhat isolated? Um, I, I just feel that we need to be doing more, given you know the considerable number that we have, and you know that as a collective, what that does for the Northern Ireland economy, but also individually for them. And I just wonder, are there any other creative ways that you could be, you know, trying to? Uh, uh, communicate this message to them, and you know, is there any way you can capture it entirely? You have the figures, you know, they exist, and the figures, the figures are quite specific. So, is is there a way that we could do it? You know, um, maybe through something a bit more formally, rather than just hoping that they're here. Yeah, it's a good challenge. We'll take that on board. Okay. Uh, and come back to you. Okay. okay. Yeah. No, that's fine. <coughs> to need. Thank you, Chair. Um, Paul, thank you very much um, for your presentation and your team's presentation today. Um, it's a very complex issue, uh, and um, it's the unknown unknowns <laughs> that is, is particularly taxing. Um, but my concern is probably, Mary, it's about the, the readiness and how you can be ready for something we don't actually know yet um, in terms of the negotiation itself. Um, my understanding is if we are looking for an extension of the transition, then that must be made by the UK government by July. That's five months. And uh, my understanding as well, within that context of five months, there can be only maybe about five negotiation uh, sessions uh, that can take place at that particular time because there's a pre um, pre-negotiation, then you've got the actual negotiation, and then you've got the follow-up and, uh, and the, the writing up of it. So each one takes nearly a month to, to, to happen. The amount of work that we're even talking about here within our own context um, and the difficulties that we're experiencing and the multi-levels um, and how one will have a knock-on effect on the other, whatever decisions are being made, it seems to be nearly impossible that we can prepare. So if we get, for example, to July and we know that there is going to be checks required in our ports, uh, etc., uh, and that we're not having a level play playing field, and we are diverging. Can we prepare, you know, in, a, in an infrastructure way for for uh, those checks to happen uh, for the, at the beginning of the year, 2021? Is that possible, even? 
So my concern is that at the point of July we won't have that level of certainty. I think just because of the there's so many moving parts, it's all very interconnected and complicated. Um, and given the experience of the withdrawal agreement, I, I think this will be run mm -hmm. to the line. Um, so if UK government gets to the point in the middle of the year and decide not to extend, I don't think that will be made in the light of being able to explain, particularly in the context of our businesses trading with GB, what that regime will look like at the ports. So our response to that, and, and Mary can go into the detail of how that's broken out into the areas, is that we need to operate on a reasonable worst case scenario. So as a department, we're looking at ourselves and uh, uh, asking internally, are our services policy area, uh, the strategies that are being developed, um, our legislation on the statute book, in a reasonable worst case scenario, is that operable on the 1st of January? Uh, and then anything that sh falls short of that or, or is an improved position will be able to manage. Um, because it, if we waited for the clarity and the certainty, yeah, you're right, and it, it just doesn't give us sufficient time to prepare and, uh, and adjust as a department. And uh, the same applies for the business community. It's just the, um, again, returning to the experience of no deal preparations, the government provided businesses here with an incredibly short amount of time to prepare for what would have been a significant change in the regime at the land border. Um, something similar may happen this time around. And, um, you know, as, you know, as the Department for the Economy, it's interesting the economy here, we can't, that can't be our working assumption. I think we have to operate something slightly different. So establishing a reasonable worst case and planning on that basis um, will ensure we're prepared as possible. Um, now, there will be areas that are beyond our control because, as Julia mentioned, these are um, many areas of reserve policy areas that we can't influence. Mm -hmm. I think we just have to escalate that, at a, um, most probably to the Brexit subcommittee, and explain there are issues that, as a department, we can't can control. In all likelihood, as an executive, they'll be on the executive control as well, uh, and escalate that risk, and at least know that we'll know what the impact of a particular sort of policy decision would be in that in that context. Is there anything you want to say about how we're no, I think just to say that we have dealt with this for a while and the experience of the no deal is, as Paul said, what we aim to do is prepare for the reasonable worst case because if you're prepared for that, you're prepared for most scenarios. Um, and so we would provide others in the department and be on with a set of assumptions on all of the issues and all of the areas for negotiation that fit into that reasonable worst case scenario. So if we prepare for that, that means that we we are best placed to, to sort of be in the right place whenever we do have a better deal because it may actually be better than we're preparing for. So have we costed that um, worst case scenario? So the 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 impact of, to the economy. Yeah. No, not this yeah. stage. So we're not we're not able to have, provide a definitive assessment um, of what the costs are. That forms part of the what we've interpreted to be an impact assessment that uh, yeah. we talked to Mr O'Dowd and, and when we've got that, um, we're more than happy to come and brief, brief the members on that, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think the, the folly of uh, the government, I saw the slide with the, uh, the quotes from various government ministers, came to the conclusion that they either haven't understood what they've signed up to, or there was, there was a degree of mendaciousness, but I can't expect a civil servant to comment on that. Um, I think the folly of the government's approach rests in, you know, raising the importance of 3.9 billion, 18% of our trade, which is north-south, above 11.3 billion, which is 53% of our trade east-west, but the government knew what it was doing. Um, could I ask, in terms of customs declarations, there were figures published some time ago what is the likely cost per customs declaration? Now, from memory, there was quite a wide range. In, yeah. I think it was like £18 to £86 or something like yeah, that. So, hey, hey, again, for, for uh, HMRC published as part of the no deal preparations of Julia, do you want to? Yeah, so those are probably the figures. That, uh, there were different ranges for import and export. Yeah. We've done some work with um, customs agents here just to understand whether those are reflective of rates that would be charged here. Um, and. They are, <laughs> yeah. but it's also clear that the rates depend an awful lot on the complexity of the declaration, the number of declarations, you know, there's a lot of variables there. Yeah. So we we don't, although you might come up with an average cost, it, mi it might not be much good in terms of every business will have slightly different concerns. 
Yeah. Can I ask, uh, in terms of trying to get the scale of this, in terms of the declarations that uh, have to be filled in, if someone, for example, is, you know, selling, and I, I'm not clear, I don't have an interest here, this isn't my wife or anyone else that I'm before, <laughs> you know, if someone's selling from their home uh, handmade jewellery, and they're, say, selling a piece and it's going to wreck some, are they going to have to fill in a form? Well, it was funny, I was talking about um, online shopping with somebody yesterday. Yes. Um, there is a sort of a customs bit of a parcel, uh, presuming the okay. jewellery was in a parcel. Um, it's not that significant. The major cost could be on the end recipient. Okay. But we don't have any sight of how this would work mm -hmm. between N I and G B. Okay. Um, but there will be a cost. I couldn't say that definitively because the postal end of things has hasn't been made clear to us yet. Um, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, in terms of, so it's going to be. If you're a micro business, you know, one person operating from their home, that potentially will just destroy you. You'll just not you'll just give up. You'll not want to if there's you know, if it's eighteen pounds or it costs something like that to fill in a customs declaration every time you're selling something for maybe fifteen pounds on your, from your eBay account, you're on. You're finished. Going the other way. What are the implications? Stuff coming from G B to Northern Ireland. What are the implications for consumer choice? Because yeah. we've all seen the adverts mm -hmm. with the asterisks in the bottom of the screen, offer does not apply in Northern Ireland. Our, our firms in GB simply going to decide it's not worth the hassle filling in all these forms and what have you. Our offer just won't apply in Northern Ireland. And what are the implications for consumer choice then? That's a real concern. Yeah, yeah absolute concern. I think so. The other way, um, so NITGB, I think customs is the primary concern. Um, the other route, uh, regulatory controls yes. come into place. Particularly if you're talking about supermarkets um, uh, and food, is a highly regulated product for good reasons. Um, and I think this is part of the argument that we need to marshal uh, and present to the UK government and to the EU of the significant consequences of not landing this properly. Um, I think I attended the uh, Michel Barnier speech. I think a recurring theme in his speech was about people, and I think that's what we need to be able to articulate: is that you know trade policy is one thing, but the impact upon vulnerable groups being able to afford their shopping bill in Northern Ireland mm -hmm. something significantly different and, and much more important. And that's exactly what we need to be able to articulate to the UK government so when they're going into the room to negotiate with the EU. Every party's at that table understand just how important those issues are. So, for example. The supply of food into Northern Ireland um, has to be maintained. Okay, if there is um, no agreement and you do end up with the active border up the Irish Sea, uh, I recall when everyone was ripping their hair out about potential land border, um, technical solutions are being talked about. Has that been explored and what does that look like? Yeah, so there was a UK government work stream that um, businesses from Northern Ireland participated in. So that was uh, called that alternative arrangements was the, the title. Um, uh, I haven't seen anything yet, but my expectation would be that something similar would need to be applied. Of how do you apply technology or facilitations to as far as possible minimise any requirements or frictions? Trusted trader schemes. That, yeah, things like that were considered. Um, electronic declaration. All of which have costs. Thank you. John. I, I begin to think this Brexit was a bad idea, Christopher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was saying, like, you should have voted for it. Prioritising north, south, over east, yeah. west was, but sure. Well, but no, uh, my, and this is not for obviously for the, my view is there shouldn't be any barriers between trade across the island or between this island and Britain. Uh, it, it's, um, it's crazy that we've got ourselves in this situation. In terms of your scenario planning, have you planned for the impact of physical checks at the likes of Lorne or, or Belfast Harbour of goods coming in from Britain? Is that part of your scenario planning? So as a department, that's not one of our statute responsibilities, so that's not included in our, um, our reasonable worst case. I think 
where that would um, be of interest to us is how those types of checks and controls or administrative processes would impact upon businesses that mm. are between them. So that, that's, that's actually the point I'm trying to make. Is surely part of your planning, and you've said the point is what those costs increase to business would be. Yeah. So have, have you you had planned for that? Well, that's scenario of, planned. Um, so. As part of the exercise that's ongoing, I think the challenge is the uncertainty. So you'll be aware the UK government published the withdrawal agreement uh, because it was late in Parliament that had to include an impact assessment. The vast majority of costs associated with that were not known at that stage. Um, that's because um, the data doesn't exist. So the exercise that we're on at the minute is the best as possible uh, try and articulate and explain uh, what are the changes that may come about in a certain scenario if we can, as far as possible, attach costing to them figures and then run them costs through what we know is the trade flows in the, uh, between north, south, uh, east, west. Okay. Yeah. I think that's us for now. Okay. Um, thank you very much, all of you, for, for the, the detail that you have provided. It's been really useful. Okay. And then and please do let us know what would be helpful for members. Chair, we, we already have a, a list we've sent down, some of which has been raised again today that we're, we're waiting to come back on. So we will continue adding to that list on a weekly basis. Okay. And we we'll shuffle that back to the first one. Okay. Members, then we're moving on to item six, which is matters arising, and there are no items. Okay, so we're moving on then to um, item seven, which is the SR 2020-15, um, the transfer of undertakings and service provision charge protection of employment amendment regulations Northern Ireland 2020. So there is a letter from the minister at page 133 of your pack which details the breach of the 21 day rule in relation to the statutory rule. Um, there is an SL1 at um, page 134 which outlines the policy proposals and there is a copy of the statutory rule and explanatory memorandum at um, page 140 and 147. Um, the statutory rule makes amendments to the transfer of undertakings and service provision change regulations to bring them into line with the limitation period for early collection, conciliation. Sure, if I can just jump in there. Members will recall the briefing we had last week from officials around um, employee relations, SRs generally. This is, is the sort of wider implication for that as it flows into transfer of undertakings in terms of early conciliation. Um, so it's, if you like, it's another piece of that jigsaw that we're now effectively having to, to approve, although it's already in place. Okay. So this um, statutory rule is subject to negative resolution. Um, if members are content with the ESR. Members can read. Yep. So that the Committee for the Economy has considered the transfer of undertakings and service provision change, protection of employment amendment regulations Northern Ireland 2020 and has no objection to the rule subject to the examiner of statutory rules report. Read. Read. Okay, so moving on then to item 8, which is the draft carriage of dangerous goods and use of transportable pressure equipment amendment EU exit regulations 2020. There is a letter from the Minister at page 164. Um, the Minister has explained these regulations were drafted by the Department for, of Transport during the suspension of the Assembly as part of the planning process for leaving the EU. The regulations will address uh, deficiencies arising from the withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the EU and ensure that the amended legislation remains operable thereafter. Um, the Minister states that in the event of the final withdrawal agreement includes an agreement on mutual recognition of goods, the UK TPE mark will not be required and relevant provisions would not come into force. So, Chair, what that effectively means is we're preparing for a scenario where the standards would be different from the EU and therefore you'd have a, a separate um, transportation mark. But the assumption is being made that because of the nature of this, it's, it's transportation of dangerous goods, it's, it's goods under pressure and so on, that we're very unlikely to change our standards on that because they're, they're there for a reason. So the assumption is that we won't necessarily need to proceed with a separate uh, marking on this, but it's really just making preparation in case we have to. Great. Just a point of clarity as well, Chair. Uh, I note that the regulations are being passed through Westminster. Uh, just the bottom paragraph of the Minister's letter. Drafting is a, this is maybe further. Maybe, uh, this is in relation to this. The Assembly. 
the provisions, Great Britain provisions under the European Union Withdrawal Act. Drafting is an advanced stage, with the regulations due to be led at Westminster the Fourth of February. The regulations are technical in nature, and to make the best use of resources, I have agreed that the carriage of dangerous goods and use of regulations, price equipment provision, be retained in the UK wide regulations. What does that mean? Mm. Well, my understanding of that, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to get further information, is that it maintains it as a as a UK whole framework rather than. Um, parts of the UK differentiating in terms of something like this that ha has a level of danger that we, we maintain a, like a national system a national framework but if members want we can we can get I'm more just wondering are we, uh, there may be valid reason for it I'm just wondering in terms are we is there legislation that was in normal times been passed through the assembly which is now being transferred back it would normally be in the EU. So, so basically what has happened is coming right. out of the um, Withdrawal Act, and members will be familiar over the period of time, the bringing into law everything that the EU did before. That's kind of an outworking yeah. of this. So the EU set these standards. There's a huge number of standards we apply on an everyday basis that we were negotiated at an EU level and that we simply applied them. This is now a recognition, I suppose, that... Because the UK has left the EU, there needs to be a consistent standard applied. So effectively, that standard has <clears throat> will be legislated for to be a UK standard, but that makes the assumption that we won't continue to have an aligned standard to the EU. If there is a continued aligned standard with the EU, then the UK provision doesn't come into force. But... Um, I'm more than happy to be corrected on that, but that's the understanding we have, that it's purely because this was previously done at, a, at a, an EU level. Now, like other frameworks, will fall to a UK level. Um, it's not something um, the Assembly's ever been able to differentiate on. Uh, uh, well, Is that helpful? Yeah, no, that's OK. I'm just, I wouldn't argue for differential treatment either. I'm just, it, it's the broader principle of under the EU withdrawal I forget the terminology that was used for a previous yeah. bill when they brought the powers back to Westminster. That, uh, the, the, some, some accused Westminster of a power grab, right? Yeah. Uh, so powers that would usually devolve to uh, the administrations was brought back into Westminster. And the problem with that is it's going to get back off Westminster. Now, this may be one of those issues where you say to yourself, it's not important. Now, it mightn't. But the general principle of Westminster taking back devolved powers and then holding on to them, mm -hmm. this is something I think we need to watch. Sure. I think I think um, I, I totally understand mm -hmm. what, what um, Mr. O'Dowd is saying. I think in this case, because of the nature of what it's covering, mm -hmm. is purely it's it's always been seen as sensible to lift that kind of safety standard to as high a level as you can. And because we no longer be able to lift it, where we participate in what the EU is doing, mm -hmm. this is a case of creating a framework for the UK if we aren't participating in an EU framework. The framework, the, the letter seems to suggest that that won't be the case. This is something that effectively has to get built into um, how you transport goods, what you do, what is allowed to cross borders, what you're allowed to, to, to put on um, uh, transport for export and all that kind of thing. It's really unlikely. Is it maybe the case, though, that this particular statutory rule is necessary and there's a limited time frame, and in order to prepare well, a particular one for Northern Ireland, it's quite technical? That's why we're doing it now, but it's very unlikely we would seek to differentiate on a, on a devolved yeah. nation basis. Yeah. But if members like, we can seek yeah. more information on what the, 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 if you like, more expanded detail on the reason for not having it back in the Assembly and why we would legislate on a UK basis. Okay. So we'll ask for that. Yeah. But that's my understanding. It's, it's simply the sort of thing that Europe had previously set the standard on and with them not setting that standard, it falls to the UK, but we're likely to align. But we would seek clarity on that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And all we are being asked is to note. We're noting that at the minute, yeah. So moving on then to item number nine, which is correspondence. Um, the committee has been copied into an invitation from the Chief Executive of Capitalist, Cap Catalyst Inc. Sorry, um, page 168 to the Minister inviting them to the, the workspace. Um, the previous committee had visited Catalyst Inc. and held a meeting there and it was very yeah. useful. Yeah. Um, so That's just really just note. for members to note, um, Catalyst have copied us in the invitation okay. because obviously we'd visited before. Um, I just wanted to keep us in the loop. Mm -hmm. Useful, maybe put down your list uh, for a possible visit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
I suspect we got our own invitation at some point as well. We usually do. Yeah. Um, Nine point two. Then yesterday, myself and Sinead spoke at the Tweed and I event in the Long Gallery, um, where Tweed and I, which is a host, or an alliance of hospitality, Ulster manufacturing, and I and retail and I, launched their Vision Twenty Thirty. Um, document. And members have that we circulated yeah. electronically. Um, it was um, it was a really well attended event. A um, good number of MLAs were there as well. And I think the the more that we are engaging with business, the better. Yeah. So. Chair, if I can update just on the back of that, um, I was party to a subsequent meeting of how the business trust will change into mm -hmm. a different kind of network, and we talked about how that engagement can be more useful on both sides. Um, you know, the discussion was, was fairly wide-ranging, involving, I think, the businesses, business community's um, lack of awareness that they can intervene on things like statutory rules. Um, this is something that's maybe worth putting out there more widely, is, yes, most of the statutory rules that the committee looks at are often technical, um, but there are some where you are looking at policy movement that people may well want to intervene on and until a rule has passed um, either by committee approval if it's subject to negative resolution or a procedure within the, the chamber if it's other kinds of statutory rule, there is always that opportunity for business to be engaged on and I just, I think that's maybe not well understood so it's something that we're looking to do some work on, okay. just so members are aware it's something we'll probably draw the committee more into. Okay. There will be a consultation process so for most of those three what, departments. What we what we try and do is develop um, a framework for maximising engagement because we found in the past, and it's it's what members were raising about SMEs and micro businesses, is they really don't have the bandwidth to get into a consultation. So what we're going to try and do is do it more on the basis of workshopping and talking directly probably involving the likes of uh, Chambers as well as the, the mm -hmm. bigger, better known um, umbrella groups. But yeah, we're very much alive to the, the fact that so many businesses here are not going to be in a position to, 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 to reply to a complicated um, consultations. We're trying to get right down into that. Um, it's it's a, a piece of work that I think will bear uh, tremendous fruit going forward. Okay, so moving on then, 9.3 was the invitation from, from Titanic Belfast to their yeah, event this morning, smart. which unfortunately clashed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, uh, they need to move it other days. Yeah. Yeah. So 9.4 then is an invitation, um, page 172, from the Institute for Government, um, which is for a session taking place this afternoon and tomorrow afternoon on Brexit for members um, to be aware of. 9.5 then is correspondence from... The member of the public yeah. regarding an alleged failure by universities to undertake the quality screening. Um, members note that one as well. Um, further correspondence is page 173. And 9.6 then is a, clerk, a memo from the, or correspondence from the clerk of the ERA committee um, outlining, it's at page three of your table pack, suggesting a joint visit to Belfast or Lauren Port. Sure, this, this very much piggybacks what actually mm -hmm. members were discussing earlier on about how um, transition and movement of goods will work. So we're looking at, um, I think, probably doing it definitely before summer recess, but trying to move it after Easter, probably just in terms of trying to get the two committees together. And um, it's likely you next to well. Yes, it's going to be less, less well, as we say that, but you know how the weather works. It could be like that any day. Standard. <laughs> <laughs> Warm coats, I think, no matter what time of year it is. So 9.7 then of your, it's page four of your table pack, um, correspondence in the Renewable Heat Association. That's to the Economy Minister and the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy regarding the closure of our HI. And um, then 9.8, there is um, correspondence on page 10 of your table pack from an individual who participated in the RHI scheme regarding the impact on their business and offering to meet myself. Um, so sure. At this stage, we're, we're asking members to note the correspondence, and yeah. what we'll do is we'll fold this into our. Um, discussions with the department on how to move on on these because yeah. I expect we'll see a lot of these mm. um, and it will become impractical very quickly to do an individual meeting so I think a lot will depend too on the hardship mm -hmm. um, report. report that's yeah. coming out and the, the permanent secretary mentioned that um, so we're, we're 
making the department aware of all the issues and w when we have one of these we don't just let it go mm. so that now becomes part of our interchange between the department and ourselves so we'll be monitoring that but we think it's probably worthwhile then being able to give us yeah. a clearer understanding for everyone rather than us meeting people without knowing uh, you know what's going to happen thank you and then finally at page 11 of your table papers there's a letter from the director of social enterprise and i um offering to brief the committee so yeah and we fold that again yeah. chair into the forward work program so then number item 10 is our forward work program um there was a revised uh, draft at page 12 of the table packs um it has now been confirmed the vice chancellor of queen's um professor ian greer will brief the committee on wednesday the 4th of march and that the private lunch um, will take place afterwards um, with um, Dr. Katie Hayward and Professor David Finnamore, and include the Vice Chancellor. Yes, Chair, the um, paper has been provided um, to a number of committees um, by Dr. Ha Dr. Hayward and Professor Finnamore around um, actions they'd identified the Assembly needs to undertake. Now, as members were assured last week, we're already doing that. We've, we've had um, ongoing work groups from that for the last three years, but I think it's useful. Uh, some members had indicated that they just wanted to be able to engage on this. So what we're basically doing is we've organised lunch after the committee meeting and the two uh, academics and the uh, VC can attend that. Okay, so great. members will get timings on that. Chair, uh, we've well, spoke uh, a number of times now about Oxford University and different projects. Can we invite them in to, um, to refer to hear their side of events? I think... In, in, in this, it was, it was simply it was these particular academics that particular, uh, oh, uh, produced a particular yeah. piece of work. Obviously, we'll be yeah. up at McGee before we do this. Mm. So what we'll do on that basis is engage with them in terms of research that they want to bring to us too. So uh, I'm thinking specifically about the Belfast yeah. project. Obviously, we, we seek briefing on that. Chair, um, I'm aware that the, the UU will want to engage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, with the committee on those issues. Mm -hmm. And we're preparing that, and it is in hand. If well, I can, I would say, I, say I, that I suspect, in terms of implications for the university, it's probably better that that would be a closed session. Than I think that the department flagged that up. That yeah. in yeah. terms of museum, yeah, how it's they want to handle that, they'd like yeah. to do it in a closed session. So that's all in hand yeah. um, as we speak. Okay. Um, the department requested the city deal briefings be deferred from the 19th of February as the paper is being prepared for the executive and if agreed will provide some clarity on some of the unknowns and uncertainties. Well, I think that's chair that if, if I might that was kind of very much flagged up today. Yeah. The executive is going to do a piece of work on this okay. and what we're doing is we're delaying the briefing so that that piece of work can be fed into it. Okay. It'll mean we have an awful lot more clarity. Okay and then we're moving on to 11. Any other business? So, can, Chair, can I just, uh, we've asked for various documents from yes. briefings. Have we received any yet? We are getting them through. Some of them um, we have been asked for extensions on because of complexities, having to get inputs from, say, the Department for Finance and, in some cases, Treasury. So they are all in hand. Um, once we get them, we start feeding them through. Some of them are, are part of a greater whole, so some of them we might actually... It might be more sense for us to hold until we have the full picture, but once we get anything that's usefully able to go forward, members will. We we maintain a a continual um, list with the department of issues that we're seeking briefing on, and they have to apply a um, turnaround time on that. They can only extend that by request. We'll only give uh, an extension where we think there's there's a, a need to do that. And in some cases, there simply has been a need. Because as officials have flagged up, there's a lot of cases where they, they can't give a definitive answer from within the committee or within the department. So they're feeding in um, inputs from other departments. But we will certainly be keeping an eye on that. And, and um, if I can reassure members, we do have that in hand. Okay. But it will st the pipeline will start, I would have thought, pretty much from next week. Uh, we expect stuff to be through. We give a two working week, well, 10 working day turnaround. So that doesn't kick in until the next meeting. We have extended on some of them, yeah. We, have we, could, put that, we could put it in the pack if you want. So. Yeah, it's it's just that's yeah. useful yeah. for members. Yeah. So you want to see it as a culture. So what we'll do is we'll put the 
read out in the yeah. tax members okay. know what's coming and what we've received and so on. Yeah. Okay. Um, as we get stuff, we, we tend to not only put it in the packet, but we quite often email it out to members so that they have it in. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then that the final item is the date, time, time and place of next week meeting, and it is in Invest NI offices yes. on Bedford Street. Mm -hmm. And the one quick thing I have to say about that is there is no parking on site. Mm -hmm. So we are glidering as a committee team, <laughs> and the nearest car park is Dublin Road. I think yeah. yes. Yeah. Bring your bicycle. We can't get our we can't get our pop ups and things on the back of the bicycle. <laughs> so we're we're going to use the glider. Well, and where are you glidering from? We're going to glide probably from the bottom of the hill. Oh, yeah. oh, right. Right. Okay. Can you but can I just flag up to members if you aren't already aware that does not fall within your um, constituency mileage. There's a form for that committee travel. It's a separate thing, but. I, I sign off a form on, yeah. and then that goes to finance. It's not contained in your constituency framework. So we talk more about that at the next meeting. If members are content. Yeah. 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.